Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Tisdale, Executive Director with GridWorks. It's our pleasure to be facilitating today's workshop and welcoming you here today. Uh, I will be very ably supported throughout this afternoon's workshop by a couple of GridWorks folks that I want to quickly identify. Maggie dunham Jordal, our project manager, Neha Bazaj, our director supporting this project, and our senior fellow, Jay Griffin. Thank you, three, for all your help in organizing and supporting the workshop today. Uh, as we're clearing the waiting room and getting folks settled, we'll just go ahead and take care of a few housekeeping items. The first is to review today's objectives. Those are here uh, on slide number two on the screen share. First is to update parties on the current proceeding scope, being the high DER uh, proceeding. Uh, the Commission's aims within that current scope, <coughs> what to expect in terms of next steps. Next objective we hope to accomplish is to share expert and party uh, perspectives on the following question. What are the operational needs necessary to efficiently operate a high DER grid? Unlock economic opportunities for DER to provide grid services, <sighs> market power, reduce ratepayer costs, increase equity while supporting grid resiliency and making, excuse me, helping to meet state policy objectives. We will uh, also work on the objective of co-creating a list of operational needs that would be responsive to this question. And finally, laying the groundwork for the focus of our next workshop, what are the existing gaps and barriers in achieving the needs identified above within our current distribution system operator utilities? That's what we are setting out to do today. That's the work we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Next slide, please. Thank you, Maggie. Here's our agenda for the afternoon. Uh, we're going to move briskly through some introductions after we finish this housekeeping. Then we will be uh, joined by Commissioner Hauk, who's gonna give us an overview of the commission's goals, and then a presentation from the commission's energy division staff about related proceedings and how they're feeding into this one. Item three on the agenda will be a presentation from Jay Griffin from the GridWorks team, just to introduce some basic concepts, terminology, and a little bit more detail on what we're trying to accomplish here and how. <clears throat> we aim to take a break at 2.05. Then we'll return for a series of panels. Panel one will include our distribution system operator utility as well as uh, the CAISO. Panel two will be a group of thought leaders who we have brought from um, other organizations and jurisdictions that are dealing with comparable issues. And then last but not least, a panel of advocates, parties to this proceeding who are going to share their perspective. We aim to uh, begin wrapping up at 4.45 for a conclusion on time at 5 p.m. That's the agenda for today. Just want to remind folks and invite you to mute your phone so that we can have a quiet workspace. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. A few announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, today's presentation and a recording of today's workshop will be available at the web link provided here. Next, uh, we want you to participate actively in this workshop. Please do so by using the Zoom raise hand function. You'll find that in the control panel at the bottom of your screen. Participating actively in the chat bar. And as I will demonstrate in a moment, engaging through Slido, which is another way that you're going to be able to provide perspective and suggestions for us. We'll give you a demonstration on that in just a moment. I also want to note that you may have great ideas come to you after this workshop. Right. We want to invite you to email those to us at the email address here provided by fe February 22nd. Uh, we would uh, welcome that uh, input by email. And uh, if included, excuse me, if provided by February 22nd, we would include it within our summary of this workshop that GridWorks will prepare and distribute to the parties by March 2nd. Next slide, please, Maggie. 
So a few more notes on how to participate here. Um, we're going to use the tool Slido to gather your responses to three questions throughout the workshop. First, beginning with introductions. Second, adding your comments to our operational needs wish list. And third, providing at the end of the workshop uh, feedback to GridWorks and the commission on the process and the workshop. And as I mentioned, there's also several features here on Zoom that will allow you to participate. Use the chat to ask questions for our speakers. Uh, if they don't have a chance to answer questions verbally during the panels, we'll invite them to do so through the chat bar. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand in Zoom and we will call on you as uh, soon as time allows. And last but not least, just a gentle reminder to stay on mute unless you are speaking. And if uh, we have background noise, we will just uh, mute you ourselves. Thank you for your understanding. So how to use Slido is an important question for your participation here today. You can join in two ways. First is to use your phone or tablet to scan the QR code that's on the screen here. Maybe I did. Let me... Um... Excuse me. Thank you, Paul. Uh, second is to go to slido.com and type in the code 7452931. That will give you access to uh, Slido for your participation here. What we're aiming to collect in Slido is your responses to a couple of questions. Uh, next slide, please, Ma Maggie. The first of that question, and this is just a, a warm up to get you used to being in Slido and participating in that way, is what is one thing you're hoping to learn today? So we use this for our introductions. We want to invite folks who are here today who plan to be active participants in this workshop. Though by active participant, I mean to say you're going to raise your hand, you're going to participate, you're going to have something to say, uh, to introduce themselves. And we will ask you to provide your name, your organizational affiliation, and enter into Slido a response to this question. What is one thing you're hoping to learn today? So I'll invite folks who plan to be an active participant to go ahead and raise hand so that we can call on you and move briskly through your introductions. And I'll just model what we're looking for. So I'm Matthew Tisdale, Executive Director with GridWorks. And as I've entered in Slido, one thing I'm hoping to learn today is what grid operators in Australia can share with California about operating a grid with lots and lots of solar. And I'm looking for hands to go next. Um, I'll give you some more time to get your hand up. And in the meantime, I'll invite Jay Griffin to introduce himself and share his question. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jay Griffin, Senior Fellow at GridWorks. Um, good to see you all. And what I'm hoping to learn today, I'm very interested in hearing from all the California stakeholders on you know, what you see as your future for the high uh, for high DER, uh, particularly some of the advocates, what your interests are and seeing the grid operators perspectives. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, so. Um... All right, I'm not seeing any other hands yet. So I'm gonna invite Commissioner Haup to go next. Commissioner, would you like to introduce yourself and share a question with us? Hi, good, good morning, um, or good afternoon, I guess it's afternoon. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, oh, is there an echo? Um, I wasn't sure about, um, I'm not sure what question, I really want to hear what, what people have to say and how we're going to ensure the operation of our distribution grid is meeting the needs of um, our 21st century clean energy goals. Um, Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Jennifer Chamberlain, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, Jennifer Chamberlain with NG North America. Um, I think I got out of this proceeding a little bit when I moved from Sea Power to NG. And so part of what I wanted to participate for today was to catch up with where we are. And I was intrigued by the study that came out last week. And so that's what I'm here to do. And I, oh, I'm the Director of Regulatory and Government Affairs. So awesome. thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Glad to have you. 
Um, if I'm pronouncing it right, Amin uh, from Cal Public Advocates. Hi, uh, yeah, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Emin Yunus. I'm with the Public Advocates Office at the California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, and I'm most excited to hear about the intersection between this work and all the other proceedings that we're going to hear about uh, from the Energy Division staff, or at least that I think we're going to hear about uh, relating to rates, interconnection, and vehicle ele electrification, because that is those are things I think about a lot. Great. Thank you, Amy. Uh, let's see. Chris King was the next hand I saw. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, um, similar to the last response, uh, particular interest in electric vehicles and how they will fit into the uh, IDR DER picture, both from a V to B, V to B, V to building, V to home, as well as vehicle to grid. A lot of work to be done there on standards and regulations. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Judge Himes, welcome. Hi there, good to see you, Matthew. Uh, I'm Kelly Himes, one of the two assigned administrative law judges to this proceeding. And I'm just curious to see what, how big of a universe we are talking about here uh, and how long it's going to take us to, to figure this out to get to a point where we're gonna be writing a decision. So I'm just curious about the, the plethora of the answers that everybody else has. Great, thanks, Judge Himes. Uh, Ariel Strauss, please go ahead. Thank you, my name is Ariel Strauss. I'm a regulatory counsel for small business utility advocates. And I'm most interested in hearing from the IOUs on limitations they, they perceive and their plans for addressing these issues. Thank you. Fantastic, Ariel, thank you for being here. Uh, anyone else want to share their question with us out loud? I see that we have um, good activity in the Slido field, so I'm glad you all are finding access to that. But if there's anyone else who wants to share your thoughts out loud before we move on, let's see hands. Uh, Minnie, go ahead, Minnie. Good afternoon. This is Minnie Damodaran. Hopefully you can hear me. We can um, hear you. I'm, yes, I'm from pg &E and I will be working on the high DER. Um, OIR track one, but I'm also interested in finding out, you know, how this relates to all the other tracks. So that's the reason I'm here. Thank you. Great, thank you, Manny. All right, let's uh, do uh, two more and then we'll move on for time's sake. Uh, Roger Lynn, go ahead from, uh, Roger, can you hear us? Yeah, can hear you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Roger Lynn from Center for Biological Diversity, interested in how we can maximize community benefits from DERs, especially, especially for disadvantaged communities. Great, Roger. Thanks so much. Good to see you again. Uh, Lucia, would you like to go ahead? Hi, yeah, my name is Lucia Pullman, and I'm from the city of San Luis Obispo, and I'm most interested in learning how local governments can best engage in this process to support our communities in reaching an equitable, decarbonized future. Awesome, Lucia, thank you so much. And last but not least, Howard. Would you like to go ahead, Howard? Yes, um, my, um, my name is Howard Gollop, and I represent the Port of Long Beach in this proceeding. And uh, the Port of Long Beach is probably the largest transportation electrification um, facility uh, subject to the commission's jurisdiction. Um, we are deeply concerned, and I would like to hear more, about the exclusion of off-road vehicles from the staff reports to date. Um, the, uh, by off-road vehicles, I include vessels. Yeah and railroads and cargo handling equipment. Great, Howard, thank you for that. I'm not sure if we're gonna be spending much time on that. That topic seems um, probably due elsewhere, but uh, let's follow up with you, at least in the chat bar to see if we can help you um, understand uh, a better place for that. Maybe the energy division staff can speak to where that question is. We've started. raised that issue repeatedly with the staff, and I do not think it should be uh, not addressed. I think it should be addressed. 
Fair enough. I just don't want you to uh, be disappointed to learn that that's not um, on the agenda today. All right, so um, let's keep moving. The uh, next slide, please, Maggie. Great, so at this time, we're gonna turn the floor over to Commissioner Hauk, who's going to uh, help us understand the goals of the commission through this process. Commissioner Hauk. Okay, thank you. Can You can hear me okay, is that correct? Okay, great, thanks, Matt. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Again, I'm Commissioner Hauk, the assigned commissioner for the High Distributed Energy Resources Proceeding. This proceeding focuses on planning and modernizing the electric distribution system to meet the needs of the 21st century. And I wanna start by thanking GridWorks for hosting and moderating today's workshop in track two of the high DER proceeding. I also want to thank our energy division staff, um, Judge Himes and Judge Lackenpaul, for all of their work on the proceeding. Uh, we really wouldn't be here having these discussions without all the efforts they've put in. Um, there are three tracks, as many of you know, in the proceeding. The first track focuses on distribution planning and execution process and data improvements. The second track focuses on distribution system operational needs and system operator roles and responsibilities. And the third track addresses smart inverter oper operationalization and grid modernization planning. Today, we're here for the first of the three high DER future grid study workshops. These workshops are part of track two and will be held over the next few months to identify distribution system operator operational needs, assess where there are air gaps and develop recommendations to address those gaps. Um, California's electricity system is undergoing a significant transformation on the path to reaching our clean energy goals. We are seeing a high penetration of renewables, the accelerated electrific electrification of buildings and transportation, and continued deployment of behind the meter DERs. Given the steady growth in the adoption of DERs, this proceeding seeks to optimize DER integration within the distribution grid while making sure that the rates customers pay are affordable. We're focusing on making distribution planning and data improvements, including assessing the impacts of electrification on utility distribution planning processes and load forecasting to accommodate the high levels of DERs coming onto the grid. As we outlined in the amended scoping memo for this proceeding, this year we plan to host our future grid distribution system operation workshop series, of which this workshop is the first. We then plan to release a track two workshop report and issue a track two proposed decision after that. So the revised um, scoping memo for track two focuses on two key questions. What are the operational needs necessary to efficiently operate a high DER grid, unlock economic opportunities for DERs to provide grid services, limit market power, reduce ratepayer cost, increase equity, support grid resiliency and meet state policy objectives is the first question. And the second one is, what are the existing gaps and barriers in achieving the operational needs identified above within our current distribution system operators, the investor owned utilities? What are the potential solutions to overcome these barriers? So we will be assessing the current system with which is operated by the investor-owned utilities in order to focus on near-term changes that may be needed for the grid of the 21st century. I want to stress that this is a starting point. It doesn't prevent us at a later date from examining other DSO models, but we really want to move quickly and ensure that we have a grid that's going to meet the operational needs to accommodate the deployment of high DER future that we're seeing. So I want to thank all of the panelists from the industry, the utilities, the community choice aggregates, Cal ISO, the advocacy organizations who have joined us for the discussion today, and all of the participants in today's workshop to get our series started. Again, thank GridWorks for all of their work. And I want to, again, thank Energy Division and the assigned administrative law judges. So I'm going to turn it back over um, to GridWorks and Energy Division um, to go through an our energy division is going to, um, as our subject matter experts, will provide the overview of the grid planning, um, transportation, electrification, resiliency, microgrids, interconnection, distribution, and retail rates, 
and I'll look forward to that. And just logistically, I wasn't sure if I'm supposed to hand it back to Matt to introduce the energy division folks, or if they're going to step in right now. And um, I can help with that, Commissioner. Thank you. And uh, just one quick follow-up question. Um, you're planning on being with us all day. Is that right? Yes, I am. I may need to step out for about 10 minutes around 2.30, but I am planning to be here this afternoon to listen to the workshop, hear folks' thoughts. Um, really looking forward to the discussion and moving this effort forward. I know it took us a little longer than we thought to get it started, but it's great that we're all here and uh, moving forward with it. So I'll turn it back to you, Matt. Awesome. Thank you. It helps so much to have uh, participation from our commissioners and judges. We appreciate y'all being here. Okay, so I will turn the floor over to Woon, who is going to kick off the Energy Division presentation. Um, thank you. Um, uh, can you change it to the slide? Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Woon Jung. I'm a high DR proceeding team member. Uh, in addition to Commissioner Hawk's remark, I will add a little more in-depth coverage of the high DR proceeding, which is a rulemaking to modernize uh, electric grid for a high number of distributed <coughs> distribute energy resources in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, three tracks are under the high DR proceeding, and I will cover a piece. The left column in blue, track one, focus on planning. It focus on improvement to the distribution planning, execution process, and utility data portal. <clears throat> From track one, we see a growing number of DR coming in the future, and many DR have export and import capabil cap uh, capability. This means we are facing a large number of bi-directional power flow in the grid, which is a challenging subject. The middle column in green, track two, and the right column in red, track three, focus on this operational challenge in the grid due to a high number of DR in the future. The difference between track two and three are track two focus on broader spectrum of grid operational management requirement of DSO, including DSO's role and responsibility beyond just the interconnection and management of the high DR. First, track three explicitly focus on the operational requirement of DER. In the other word, it focus on leveraging advanced functionality to grid service by operationalizing smart inverter and DER. <clears throat> this workshop is for track two. The next slide will cover track two more detail. Next slide, please. As the scoping map, go, go ahead. Uh, as the scoping memo is revised, Utilities are the current distribution system operator, DSO. Here is the revised set of a scoping question for track two. First question in the scoping memo, what are the operational need of the distribution grid to accommodate a high number of DR that are safe, reliable, efficient to the grid? fair and affordable to all stakeholders, including ratepayer, while supporting California decarbonization goal. Today's workshop number one will come, <coughs> today's workshop number will delve into this operational need. Second question, first part of a scoping memo, conducting a gap analysis of identified operational need from workshop number one, First, the current capability of system operator managed by utility will cover in workshop number two. Then second part, second, second question, second part, what are the potential solutions to bridge the identified gap from workshop number two and foster future grid development 
we'll cover in workshop number three. Next slide, please. As a reminder, pursuant to State Assembly Bill 327 and Public Utility Code Section 769A, DER include energy storage, demand response, energy efficiency, electric vehicle and supply equipment. Due to this, several associate proceedings interact with the high DER future proceeding. As you can see from the bullet point, transportation electrification, microgrid, interconnection, and demand flexibility are among them. Therefore, first, it is important to understand the primary objective of this proceeding, and second, how they will be affected by high DR future grid operation. These two questions will help us determine whether high DR future grid operation will help or hinder their objective. Four associate person team listed in this slide will provide overview more detail in the next slide. I will turn to RGV. Thank you very much. Hello, can you guys all hear me all right? Yep, you're coming through, Audrey. Thank you. Great. Um, well, thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Audrey Newman. I'm a senior analyst on our transportation electrification team. Um, and specifically, I oversee our work on vehicle grid integration and some of our work to help facilitate long term um, planning for transportation electrification specifically and how that coordinates with our ongoing planning efforts through proceedings like this one. Um, next slide, please. So for today, um, you know, the proceeding I'm going to talk about is R2312008, which is the proceeding that deals with transportation electrification policy and infrastructure. Um, as I sort of mentioned a second ago, there's a lot of different points of interaction between these proceedings, um, for, between this proceeding and the high DER proceeding. Um, but maybe I'll just start with a little bit of background here. So this proceeding opened this past December as a continuation and an advancement of our previous TE proceeding or rulemaking, the drive, the drive rulemaking. Uh, the goals of this proceeding are to further policy related to TE, including TE grid planning to support charging infrastructure deployment, behind the meter infrastructure investment to support state goals, vehicle grid integration, and ongoing TE policy development and collaboration. So for the purposes of today's discussion on oper operational needs for a high DER grid, I'll be talking specifically about the interaction with our work on vehicle grid integration. As a little bit of background, um, you know, there's a lot of different definitions for what we mean when we say VGI. However, the commission does have an adopted definition for VGI. Um, so I figured I would just read that out right now as a little bit of a level set. We define VGI as any method of altering the time, charging level, or location at which grid connected light, medium, or heavy duty EVs or off-road EVs or equipment charge or discharge in a manner that optimizes EV or equipment interaction with the electric grid and provides net benefits to ratepayers. So what R2312008 is trying to do in regards to VGI was preliminarily outlined in our preliminary scope in December. And so what we're trying to do is to establish goals and targets for the advancement of VGI assess programmatic and policy interventions and affordability considerations with a focus on three areas, which are our three strategic focus areas for VGI. The first being technology enablement, and this is specifically not technology development, but you know how we are reducing barriers to the deployment of VGI technology. Rates and demand flexibility program. So this will have to do with our coordination on setting price signals and something that my colleague Chintia will speak to a little bit more after I speak. And then TE grid planning. So this is specifically not creating new grid planning processes, but informing existing grid planning processes. And um, to Howard, to your point earlier, you know, I think that's really the interaction between these two proceedings that 
probably more to do with track one of high DER. So the next procedural step for VGI within our key proceeding um, is that we have a PHC or pre-hearing conference scheduled for the end of February. Uh, and following that, we will have a scoping memo. And the scoping memo will help to outline and advance our priorities on what this proceeding is going to aim to resolve on VGI. Um, and, in, and in addition, if you guys are all interested, we have a uh, VGI forum that will be announced shortly and will be held at some point in Q1 to discuss some of these interacting um, factors between different proceedings. So moving on to kind of the bottom of my slide here, what are some of the challenges and the interaction points? I think, you know, just to, just to introduce this, these are certainly not the only challenges and they're not the only interaction points. This is a couple to highlight today. The first is um, determining achievable potential for V1G and V2G. So in order to determine the potential impact or benefit to the, distribu to the distribution system resulting from vehicles, we first need to establish some reasonable assumptions and expectations about how vehicles are going to behave, including for unidirectional or V1G and bidirectional V2G or V2B, V2X. This is really critical and a really critical first hurdle to overcome as it will help us determine how best to prepare the operations of the system to handle EV load and at what scale. Um, you know, this is also very critical um, in terms of, plan of grid planning, however, not, not really the focus of what we want to deal with today. So one challenge now is that many different sources and processes have different V1G and V2G projections and all seem to be fairly large estimations. And, uh, you know, it's hard for us to plan our operations if we don't have a better sense of what to expect. So that better and more common understanding is gonna be key to repairing our system. Um, and then how we're planning to address this on the TE side, um, we aim to have a study through our contractors to help establish some of these assumptions and then some of these results can help inform other utility and commission work in this area. The second item I wanted to talk about was addressing identified technical barriers to enable widespread deployment of VGI. So as I mentioned, we see one role of the utilities in this proceeding, and the, uh, sorry, in the TE proceeding as technology enablers rather than technology developers. <laughs> so, what I mean by this is that we're identifying technical barriers to deployment, including third-party deployment of, techno of VGI technologies that help to reduce the impact uh, to the system, shift load, or enable export to the grid. So through our OIR, we're gonna aim to identify many of these barriers, including for automated load management and bi-directional chargers. And we expect uh, more, specific, more specific direction to come after our pre-hearing conference and scoping that more issued. Uh, one current action in this area that's happening is uh, through SCE's pilot on LCMS or load control management systems, which is aiming to identify process and technical barriers to deploying third party behind the meter load control management systems to enable flexible and incremental energization. And then the last one I wanted to identify here was just um, identifying price signals and incentive opportunities to encourage customer behavior. So one of the most critical roles that the commission has in furthering VGI and helping vehicles serve as grid assets in addition to load is through price signals. Without the proper price signals, we cannot encourage drivers and fleet operators to charge and or discharge in a manner that reduces impact to our system, including our distribution system. So you're gonna hear much more about demand flexibility and price signals from my colleague Achintia. Um, however, we're working in very close coordination with the Chinti and his team as they help to identify appropriate price signals that reflect cost causation, so not, not cost shifting. Um, but the other goal is also to encourage drivers and fleet operators to charge or discharge at times that are beneficial for the system. Um, this process is beginning with dynamic pricing and will be tested through our PG&E V2X pilots. But some key questions down the road may include how to differentiate by location on the distribution system to encourage or if deemed appropriate, provide incentives for certain behavior. 
Um, so lots of close coordination on these issues is going to be essential, not only between high DER and TE, but also through the other proceedings you're going to hear from after me. So thank you, and I'll hand it back to you, Matthew. Thanks so much, Audrey. And next, we'll hear from Patrick Saxton about similarly the relationship between the microgrid proceeding and work and the high DER work here. Thanks, Matt. Um, my name is Patrick Saxton. I'm a senior utilities engineer on the grid resiliency and microgrids team. Um, let's just go to the next slide, please. So there is no fixed definition for a microgrid, but for CPUC purposes, there is there is a definition in the public utilities code. It's here on the slide. Um, the main aspect of it is that the microgrid will both be capable of operating in parallel with the overall grid, and then also in a standalone or isolated mode. Um, the other major takeaway I'd like people to have is that a microgrid does not imply any specific type of resources. So it's neither inherently clean or not clean, or you know includes storage. Most of them will, but it doesn't explicitly have to. So it's it's a um, you know a a uh, an agnostic word, and um, sometimes that gets lost for for some people. Um, because of that, no specific uh, topology or deployment, it's really all of these other proceedings that you're hearing about from energy division that can be applicable to microgrid. A microgrid might be one way to do all of those things. You know, it may include elements of transportation, electrification, or it's definitely going to include interconnection. Um, so it's really a, a need to uh, coordinate and make sure that microgrids can participate and be part of all of these other activities. Um, the current focus of the microgrid proceeding is to develop tariffs that allow community microgrids to use the utility distribution grid when it is in an isolated or islanded mode. Um, that's another way of saying that a community microgrid is connected to multiple customers or multiple premises. Another current focus is implementing the microgrid incentive program, which is designed to support vulnerable and disadvantaged communities. Next slide, please. So uh, a microgrid can provide all the functionality of distributed energy resources. Uh, it can coordinate be with um, between the resources and loads. And then additionally, it's you know the the unique thing about it is that it can also provide resiliency. Um, I did want to note that in some non-microgrid scenarios, site controllers can also provide that coordination between DERs and loads. Um, because most microgrids will spend most of their time in grid connected mode, it makes all of these, uh, ensuring that all of these coordinated efforts, uh, it makes that even more important. So specifically coming out of this high DER proceeding, that would be the efforts on developing additional markets and services. And those are all going to be broadly applicable to, to the DERs and loads within a microgrid. Um, the high DR proceeding will, will, you know, basically take the lead on most of those issues. And then within the microgrids proceeding, uh, we'll be making sure there's nothing that is, uh, conflicting or, um, failing to enable microgrids to be able to, um, use all of those uh, services and markets that are being developed. Um, a significant common theme between the two proceedings is standardizing regulatory requirements for things like eligibility, rates and tariffs, and definitions, and all of that will increase the feasibility of actually deploying microgrids. Next slide, please. Um, so when operations and services are developed in the high DER proceeding, um, 
because the DERs and loads within a microgrid can access those, they're likely to become a source of blue sky revenue for the microgrid. And that will allow the those loads and resources to meet both grid objectives and the microgrid objectives. Um, and one of the main ways to achieve that is to make sure that the DERs and loads within the microgrid are treated equivalently to those outside of the microgrids. As an example, you may have storage within a microgrid that must maintain a minimum state of charge for resiliency purposes. Uh, that leaves an uh, incremental portion of the storage, possibly, probably, a significant portion of that storage that is available for market and program participation. Um, so we want those rules and eligibility within that are developed within this high DER proceeding to ensure that that storage can actually do that participation. Um, this just makes it a critical path item to ensure that the eligibility and rules are correct. Um, if we fail to achieve that, then it's unlikely we'll make efficient use of available resources and um, you know, substantive differences in those rules can make it much less uh, viable for development of microgrids. Um, that's all of my slides. Thank you, Matt. We'll hand off to Jose. Thank you, Patrick. Jose, are you ready to go? Uh, yes, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just making a sound check, you can hear me, correct? Yep, we can hear you well. Good afternoon, Jose. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jose Aliaga Carroll. I'm a utilities engineer in the interconnection and distribution engineering team. Our team handles topics on interconnection, Rule 21, and energization, Rules 15 and 16. Next slide. Uh, as of yet, we do not really have a proceeding for Rules 15 and 16. Most of our efforts have been on interconnection. The objective of our current Rule 21 proceeding is to streamline interconnection of DERs. Uh, in particular, for generation, we're implementing limited generation profiles to allow greater use of existing grid capacity and avoid distribution grid upgrades. Uh, most recently, a draft resolution on LGP was mailed for comments on January 21st, 2024. It resolved many issues. Uh, one of them includes the granularity of profiles allowed for the LGP interconnection options. We're still, we are still waiting for standards regarding scheduling to be I won't published. be here, so. Our, our team supports a high DR future by enabling faster interconnection. The SIO, WG's firm and non-firm capacity limits build upon limited generation profiles, and I will show that later. Some of the challenges we see are how to avoid this, the stranded capacity uh, that is explained on the SIO, WG report, and upgrades to lower ratepayer costs. How to ensure upgrades are performed only when necessary, and what is the cost responsibility of those upgrades? Uh, to date, of course, it's been, you know, the uh, person who initiates the upgrade pays for the upgrades or rate pairs. But within our rulemaking, we've been exploring, you know, a shared mechanism and uh, some issues still remain open. So we're looking forward to hearing from uh, stakeholders and to mutual collaboration to resolve them. Uh, next slide, Matt. So this is a conceptual illustration of limited generation profiles and non-firm capacity limits. Uh, it shows a 24 value profile per year for clarity. So it is merely conceptual. Uh, the 12 value profile was not adopted in the draft resolution. Uh, the limited gener in this case, the limited generation profile is the firm capacity, the maximum a generation facility could export to the grid. The purple 
vertical lines show a possible non-firm capacity limits that would allow an LGP customer to exceed its export. Note, however, that this is not contemplated in the LGP draft resolution, but merely shown here uh, to represent what the SIO WG report uh, has, uh, you know, states. Also note that the draft resolution adopts three different LGP configurations, which will narrow down the margins of the non-firm capacity between the LGP values and the ICA static grid values. Those are, uh, that is it for me, Matt. Thank you, hand it over to you. All right, thanks a lot, Jose. And last but not least, uh, California demand flexibility. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Achintia Maduri. I'm a senior analyst with the retail rates team. And um, I work, um, uh, I, I focus a lot on the demand flexibility rulemaking and specifically the dynamic retail rates aspect of the demand flexibility rulemaking, which I'll be talking about um, in the next few slides. So next slide, please. Uh, this rulemaking um, was launched with the goal to develop policies to achieve widespread customer adoption of automated fl demand flexibility solutions throughout the state um, with, the, with the intent that these uh, de solutions, demand flexibility solutions, lower long-term system costs may, and make have all the benefits of making electricity bills more affordable, enabling widespread electrification and are scalable and can be adopted by both bundled and unbundled customers. There's also a twin goal, which is the CEC has adopted uh, an update to its load management standards, um, which require um, all the IOUs and uh, many of the large CCAs to offer optional dynamic hourly cost-based rates. So this rulemaking, this track of this rulemaking is deliberating on the, the, the types of rates, on how these rates ought to be designed and um, in, in for IOU applications that will be CEC compliant. CC load management standard compliance. Uh, in terms of the tie-in to the high DR proceeding, um, uh, some of the key issues are how can the IOUs utilize uh, dynamic distribution prices to delay or reduce distribution system upgrades? Um, this has been highlighted, the cost, potential costs of upgrades has been highlighted in many studies. And so what are the techniques or what are the avenues for using dynamic distribution pricing to mitigate or alleviate some of those upgrade needs? And secondly, how can existing DSO systems be used to enable the type of dynamic distribution pricing that could indeed reduce long-term system costs? So next slide, please. In terms of what demand flexibility means, I, I wanted to highlight that this is, this is a, a, from a staff presentation, but the idea being that um, as prices which are more cost reflective are sent to devices that have the ability to be flexible in demand. This can lead to a reduction in peak loads, a reduction in energy procurement costs, and most importantly, reduction in the required infrastructure that's needed to support an electrified um, renewable grid. Uh, so again, the idea is widespread adoption of demand flexibility can reduce peak loads, and this leads to reduced cost of service. Next slide, please. Energy Division staff has uh, presented, uh, has, has a proposal called the CalFuse proposal um, for how demand, um, real dynamic pricing should be offered. Um, and it's it's not just a rate um, design, it's, it's, it's a three pillar framework, which includes ensuring standardized price access, ensuring that dynamic prices convey not just real-time energy prices, but they also convey real-time capacity prices, including generation and distribution and that these prices can be bi-directional so that imports and exports are getting appropriately compensated based on the real-time conditions. This framework also suggests that the IOU should include um, options for energy optimization. Um, I won't be talking much about that, but th these just wanted to highlight these as, as the key elements of um, the, the issues that are being discussed in the demand flexibility rulemaking. Next slide, please. So 
Um, in addition to this proposal, uh, CPUC has actually authorized many pilots. And most recently in the demand flexibility rulemaking, there was an expansion of the authorized pilots. Um, there is a target for 150 megawatts of flexible demand to be enrolled into um, these, these uh, CalFuse type uh, rate type pilots in both PG&E and SCE service territories. Um, and the idea is again, um, this is this is conveying this this slide shows highlights what the rate looks like on on different types of days. Um, and it's worth highlighting that the delivery price would which is um, would 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 convey the local distribution congestion to the customers um, and uh, enable response in that that could alleviate um, some of the local distribution congestion, which is a key part of ensuring that the distribution grid is also being utilized as effectively as um, the, the system grid could be utilized with more dynamic pricing. Next slide, please. Uh, ED staff in its recommendations has suggested that dynamic prices should be scarcity-based, meaning that they are a function of load at any given point. So just as um, the, the capacity price for um, generation capacity or flexible capacity should be um, a function of the system load, the suggestion from energy division is that um, the distribution capacity should also be a function of local distribution load, which means that for, for prices to reflect that, those that needs to be an input stream um, for the price generation um, part of, of uh, dynamic prices. So uh, the challenge for the high DR future, can existing IOU systems be used to enable the systems and processes for dynamic pricing. Um, currently, our, the CalFuse pilots are relying on third-party forecasts for generating distribution load forecasts. Um, so a potential solution uh, that, that uh, I think merits discussion is could, could existing data streams from the IOUs, existing SCADA data, uh, be, be integrated with the price machine, that is the, machine, the, the component that generates the prices to um, enable the generation of uh, truly load reflective prices on the distribution system. So that's all I have for my slides. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Agentia. That brings us to the conclusion of the Energy Division presentation. Uh, thank you to you five for getting us started off right. You've given us a lot to think about. Folks, this is the context. This is the high DER context in which the conversation that we're having here in this proceeding is taking place. And we want to invite you to reflect on what you've heard here in these presentations from the Energy Division and what they lead us towards in terms of recommendations for new operational needs that uh, the California operators um, can develop over, over time, uh, capabilities they can develop to, to help meet the goals of these proceedings. Uh, you've all uh, been active in the Slido, uh, which is a great start. I wanna invite you to go back to that space now uh, as you reflect on the presentations we just heard from staff, if you have an idea about an uh, operational capability, operational need that you heard or uh, uh, or would suggest, um, go ahead and bring it bring it forward in that Slido column right now. You'll see that uh, others are are bringing ideas there, and it's uh, going to amount to a good collection with your help. All right, so we are um, two minutes ahead of schedule. I want to check and see if there are any questions that folks want to pose for the Energy Division about their recommendations for the high DER proceeding. In a couple minutes, we can take a couple questions. Brian Turner, go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, I think. I would love to hear more about the uh, limited generation profile, where that is at as a um, uh, advice letter, and what would be required to get to flexible interconnection, right? Those are the uh, limited generation profile is a very small slice of the capabilities that are available to something that is truly flexible and can evolve over time as the distribution load and capability evolves. Um, so, it's an invitation for uh, what would be required to move from that, what we are currently discussing to that future. 
what uh, operational capabilities would be needed to meet that uh, that uh, vision for the LGP for the it's, on, it's option, operational but also regulatory, right? We've got a LGB P that's based on two periods, I believe, um, and the. What would it look like to have a regulatory structure or a regulatory process to get us to a regulatory structure that could accommodate a truly flexible interconnection? Great. Cool. Thank you for that, Brian. As as we feel our way through this conversation and uh, try to help one another understand uh, what's in focus here and what's in focus in other proceedings, I would say that the utility presentation that's coming up here shortly is going to give a, a fair amount of perspective on what they feel is necessary in terms of capabilities. Uh, and that is um, uh, well placed here. Uh, the larger regulatory structures that are needed beyond the operational capabilities, uh, I'll just let that be for the time being. I think that's gonna go beyond what we take up here at the moment, but for the operational capabilities that we need the utilities to have, that's right here. And I think we'll hear more about that shortly. All right, I am seeing we have time for Mr. Griffin's presentation, and we will uh, turn the floor over to you, Jay. This is going to be just a short 10 minutes, getting folks a little bit further oriented to the conversation here. Thanks. Go ahead, Jay. Great. Thank you, Matthew, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Matthew said, I'm going to give a short overview of our three-step process here and some of the basic terminology. So, Maggie, if we could proceed forward. Uh, just high level overview of our process. Workshop one um, is focused on scoping question one, which Moon went through earlier this morning. And our really our intended goal through the afternoon is to develop a list of future grid needs uh, compiled through the work here and the thoughts of all the participants, as well as the discussion among the panelists. We're going to use that information in is a fundamental part of looking at a gap assessment in the next workshop. And this focuses on the first part of question two, uh, looks at where the gaps are between what's needed in the future and current operations. And workshop three is the second part of that question, or second question, uh, and really a focus on the recommended Please actions to the commission. Where, do the, where does this lead to? Um, Gridworks will compile all the information and the discussion through these workshops and into a report, the future grid study. So this is one of your opportunities uh, to be a part of the record and to weigh in through your contributions here and how those are reflected and compiled in that study. Uh, I think as um, Commissioner Houck said, that'll be submitted to the commission and there'll be further opportunity for formal comment uh, that the commission will take is part of their decision making. So if we can step forward to the next slide. So this was a question that has come up um, through some of the uh, panelists that have uh, 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 preparing their remarks and the key part of the first scoping question, what are the operational needs of the future distribution grid? And I've started uh, to provide an overview on this using conceptual model uh, that Paul Paul D. Martini has developed, and I think there's some good information that is reflected in a recent USDOE report that's cited here, uh, discussing the evolution of distribution systems. And the basic concept here is that this can be done stepwise or in three different stages here, uh, and over time, as the relative amounts of distributed energy resources increase, the operational capabilities that the, the grid. Uh, need to accommodate, uh, well, and really, and, and need to evolve to make the best use of all those resources. And it, when you look at some of the broad guidance on where you move from stage one to stage two, uh, in, the, in the U.S., California and Hawaii are really the two states that are on the cusp of moving from stage two into stage three. And the work among this group here is really to define and identify what's needed to move to the very high level of this curve. And so the underlying premise is California utilities will need to upgrade uh, their distribution system operations for the future grid, taking an attempt uh, using some of the literature here to, uh, to define that and operational needs as newer enhanced capabilities that are required to reliably operate a distribution grid with 
uh, high penetration of distributed energy resources. And our goal today is to really co-create uh, that list with your input on what those needs are. We can step forward to the next slide, please. And just to give some uh, some overview and some a bit more detail and context on what we mean by distribution grid operations versus some of the other uh, items that may not be in the focus or scope of this proceeding. Uh, so very basically, distribution grid operations are safe, reliable, resilient operation of a distribution system. And really at its core in, involves two different functions. All of the complex um, operational switching operations that are needed to maintain reliable service in accommodating you know, scheduled maintenance activities uh, that the utility needs to do to update, upgrade and maintain their distribution lines, uh, isolating faults as they happen and restoring service. So this is really a lot of the work that goes on behind the scenes uh, to isolate parts of the system and restore power uh, that keep the lights on uh, as best as possible during all the different types of events that can happen on a distribution system. Uh, so those are the complicated switching operations, but there's also the ongoing management of voltage and reactive power to provide uh, service to all the homes and businesses uh, to to power our, our uh, all the devices in our home. So those are the really the core functions and what's increased over time are the, the needs to uh, physically coordinate increasing amounts of distributed resources, potential for microgrid operations uh, to ensure that those operations are still safe, reliable and resilient and coordinate all these new resources coming onto the system. And so I think this is uh, broadly what we mean in scope for distribution operations. And what we're trying to leave out of that for now are activities related to distribution planning, market operations, and alternative system operator models. Uh, if we can step forward, Maggie. This is the last slide here. And I think this is um, try to give some flavor, some examples of types of future outcomes that uh, we believe have been represented before and are uh, understood to be of interest in a high DER future. And some uh, examples of how you'd step through the, the three-step process here that we've talked about. Uh, so one future outcome that's already well underway are fully enabling community microgrids. Uh, an operational need that you could see to do that would be seamless transition between grid-connected modes and island modes for that microgrid, the, 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 both the, the microgrid and the, and the distribution operator being able to do that. Current gap may be limitations on the IT systems, both at the uh, for the system operator and potentially the communications from the microgrid operator or controller itself. And the future solution or barrier you'd want to inform the commission and the ILUs are providing uh, scope and support for upgrading their systems to support that future operation. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, we're talking about transportation and electrification, looking at EV charging, you know, at very high scale, I think there's been discussions underway about how to manage charging to uh, avoid overloading distribution infrastructure in the near term to accommodate those type those fleet operations uh, without needing massive upgrades in the near term. Uh, this is some of the information from the Smart Inverter Operational Working Group. Uh, there was uh, discussion about communications needed from uh, with the operator to schedule those charging activities on a more granular time scale. So moving beyond just a fixed schedule to things that could change uh, for on a weekly basis, daily basis, or even hourly. And those would be partly implemented through the recommendations uh, from that report on improving load flexibility. So Matthew, that's a quick overview of the introductory material. Um, uh, that's all we have here. So we want to okay. pause there or I think we'd have a break plan next. Thank you, Jay. We're uh, just about ready for a break, but I want to pause and just emphasize here the, the purpose of the last nine, 10 minutes is to really get you oriented to the process here. Um, what's in scope, what's not in scope, give you a couple of examples of the type operational needs and barriers to meeting those needs and what we can do about it just to uh, help you sort of get on the same wavelength as what we think we're aiming for. And so we we'll wanna pause 
because if folks are disoriented to the process and what we're aiming for or have a very different um, objective in mind, this would be a good time to clear that up. I'm comfortable with silence as a facilitator, but I'm gonna interpret it as you're not clear on what we're doing. If you are clear on what we're doing, if you are clear on this process and what it's aiming for, give me some information to indicate as much. You could raise your hand and give that as an indication that you're understanding what's going on. All right, you got I'm in, Sean, Byron, good. If you're not feeling this, say something. Good, more hands indicating understanding. Great, great, a whole bunch of people who are with us, good. All right, now this is like real human communication, it worked. All right, let's give you all a break, all of you people who now understand and got your hand up, you're doing great. We want to take 10 minutes and come back at, let's see, that will be 2.15, and we will dive deeper beginning with a panel of the investor-owned utilities and the ISO. Thank you all, look forward to seeing you then.
Ahí vale. Okay, great. It's 2.15 and we have a lot of fun ahead of us. So why don't we go ahead and get started? I want to welcome uh, our next five presenters, the panelists from uh, the Investor in Utilities and KAISO. They are Devin Rouse from Southern California Edison, Quinn Nakayama from Pacific Gas and Electric, Kirsten Peterson and Christopher Franco from San Diego Gas and Electric, and Jill Powers from the KISO. We have uh, asked these panelists, as well as the others that will follow, to help us begin to explore the main question, the main objective of the workshop here. What are these operational needs and capabilities that we need to be developing to support a high DER future? 
Uh, want to thank uh, each of these panelists for putting uh, thought to that and um, preparing these slides to help us get started. Uh, I'm going to begin by turning the floor over to Devin. And Devin, you can um, let us know when you want us to advance the slides. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, you can go ahead, at least one. Um, maybe a couple, one more, please. And so, yeah, uh, thanks, again, Matt. Devin Ross, as you mentioned, with SCE. Uh, I'm a manager of a group called Grid Strategy and Policy at Edison. And so, really, this topic is what I work on. 40 plus hours a week, if not more. Um, so, you know, near and dear to us and happy to be here and talk about it. So high, at a high level, we have kind of three components. Questions will be parked at the end of this panel. So skip that for us. But I'm going to cover kind of generally what we think success looks like on this topic. Quinn is going to cover probably a little bit more detailed around future customer grid needs, some of the technical components of that. And then Kirsten is going to come on and talk about the operational needs and sort of the evolution that we're already partway through. So uh, next slide, please. You can go one more. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this one, we want to just start with, uh, I covered this a little bit as I talked about Kirsten there, but we think this is a journey that we're already partway through and really appreciate Jay, your uh, slide kind of covering that, right? And that uh, advancing the distribution system has been a topic for almost a decade now in California. And we really do think that we're heading down that right path. Uh, but we do think there's a lot more change coming. That change does lead to new challenges, new complications. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, our role is still kind of the same thing in that the, the electric system writ large provides a service to the uh, society. And the role that we play as the operators is we really want a safe, reliable, clean, affordable. I'll throw in uh, resilient because Jay had that one. We missed it. But, you know, all those good objectives, we think that that's the right way to operate the grid. And that's key central to the state achieving uh, decarbonization goals at the lowest overall cost. In order to do that, you know, historically, certainly at the distribution level, it's been very grid centric, right? So we talk about switching, we talk about um, controlling electron flow through the utility infrastructure. As we look at the future here, and we're already, you know, kind of, again, partway through this, a lot of the change is around starting to leverage those customer devices further and further and actually changing the electrons needed at those endpoints on the distribution grid and whether it's bringing electrons from behind the meter in front of the meter or routing uh kind of changing the scale volume of them needed for behind the meter like that's that's some of the change in customer centricity that we're thinking about there um third point kind of want to make here is we have been talking about der's a lot in the past decade we really do think transportation electrification is a pretty unique DER, both in terms of scale that we'll see, uh, in terms of challenge and that the nature of it being mobile presents a whole lot of challenges, uh, but it also presents a lot of opportunities. You have ways to influence where charging happens, when charging happens, uh, leveraging the discharge of those devices in given areas. So it's just kind of a unique DER that we really want to make sure is a focus for us. And I think it really dovetails well with the VGI topic we heard earlier in that proceeding. The one other note I'd make here is we talk a lot about DERs, and I think we have a footnote there at the bottom that energy efficiency is included, but I do think it's really important as we talk about the future of the grid, and it is part of this proceeding itself, is that load growth, sort of the need for electricity is part of operating the grid too. So DERs in a lot of ways change the load needed, they change the tools we have to operate, but at the same token, we're going to see continued need for electricity beyond DER. So as a couple examples, right, I see it in the chat. There's a lot of mention of AI uh, taking notes for people. Ultimately, there's a data center behind those AI tools, right? Those data centers lead to load on the system. So we're going to have to be mindful of things like that that present additional challenges beyond some of the challenge and opportunity that DERs present. And then the last kind of high level point for where we think we're going is to date, the different voltage classes of the electric system have mostly operated independently. That's kind of where we use the fragmentation term. Um, and we've also considered kind of different parts of our distribution system fairly independent from each other. But we really think this future we're heading towards is in order to get to the affordability, in order to get to kind of the right outcomes at the right cost, it's all about orchestrating and getting kind of harmony from what customers are doing to what the grid needs to what the grid is doing and really emphasizing that role that uh, partnering across voltage classes, partnering 
with customers, partnering with other third parties, like that's really the impetus for this DSO topic and really getting that orchestration place is uh, a really key tool for us. So next slide, please. And apologies, I'm going fast because I think I have about five minutes for my part. Um, so on this slide, really wanted to highlight that, you know, there are factors outside of the utility that are influencing a lot of what the change we're seeing is. So it's everything from technology to markets or new markets, climate change. I think everyone can appreciate that, especially if you live in Southern California the past week, uh, pretty unique. And then policy is important driver for everything we do. So on the technology point, Obviously, distribution system operation is a lot, you know, in utility speak, it's grid management. So we are in our journey around advancing our grid management capabilities. And we really think that the ones we're doing are valid and will continue to be valid. And they're going to be needed. We'll need to expand them a bit over time, but we really think those are key in operating the grid safely and reliably. So using technology to advance our grid management is key. Uh, addressing customers' growing needs this is kind of the uniqueness of the graphic on the left. All these different factors can either impact, I like the wording earlier that I, now I'm going to forget of hinder or help. I forget who said that, but you know, one way is all these factors can hinder customers, but we really want them to help customers. And so we think of that as how do you support customers' needs, their growing need for electricity, whether it's electrification or just uh, sort of traditional load growing, really important part of operating the grid. And also, as I mentioned, Climate change is one of those exogenous factors that's just going to change how the grid operates. It will change how customers operate, um, customers' demands for electricity. And so can't lose sight of the, the factors outside of our control and in our environment that will really also drive some change for us. Uh, kind of third point here, again, I touched on it on the prior slide, but harnessing customers as partners is huge for us. So we do think customers will adopt a lot of technologies that present a lot of opportunities. And we want them to be our partners with that. So how do we help them make the right choices there? How do we help them uh, use those technologies to make it a cost-effective choice? And then ultimately, how do we become part and partners with them and KISO to orchestrate the grid and make sure that across voltage classes, across all the needs that the grid will see that we really get the most value out of all the technologies that customers will have in the future. And last but not least, it was the first point on the first slide, Achieving state policy is huge, right? Like that is what drives the utilities in a lot of ways. It's what drives the PUC in a lot of ways. And so we know that these decarbonization targets are ambitious. We know that they'll lead to a lot of change and managing through that change is really critical to maintain affordability and improve equity, right? So we often talk about it at SC at least, which sure other IUs do too. Like we can't leave people behind in this transformation. I think Commissioner Huck touched on it. This is a massive transformation. It's a transformation for everyone. We need to make sure everyone is part of it. So next slide, please. So again, what does it take to be successful? Technology evolution here. It is a huge part of the electric system technology. I, I love this fact. Uh, the elect North American electric system is arguably the world's largest machine. It is a technology machine and it operates in ways that I th think would mind boggle a lot of people when you really get into it, myself included. And so, you know, we do need to continue to advance as technology comes out. We need to use it. We need to leverage it. And we really need to continue to implement some of the technologies we've been working on to advance. But then as we see new solutions, like again, VGI is a great example. When we talked about uh, grid mod almost a decade ago, VGI was more a glimmer of hope in a lot of people's eyes, but now I think it's becoming really material. And so how do we make sure VGI, for example, becomes a really central part of our technology path moving forward? Uh, policy advancement, big one here. Uh, how do you enable full grid orchestration, right? So what are the rules? How do you align and prioritize across needs? I know Kaiso is going to speak shortly here and Quinn's going to touch on this too, and that we see the challenges, whether it be load growth, uh, voltage issues, climate change driven impacts, they're going to happen at everything from the smallest assets on our system all the way up to the bulk power system level. And DERs and customers are a good solution across all those, but there may be challenges of overtaxing customers and asking customers and DERs to do too much. So how do you sort of navigate through the right times, right places to use customers versus other technologies. That's just something we'll all have to think through. Um, and ensuring that we have fair competition 
I think that's central, probably don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but it's going to just be important that we're enabling markets, we're allowing uh, the markets to deliver and we're not stifling competition. So a lot of policy space that's, I think, a lot of room for this track in particular to focus on will be good for us to explore in the future workshops. And then last but not least, the customer part of this. Again, we really do think customers are central. I'll, I keep saying customers, customers is a broad Who's third parties, just to be clear. Um, but we do think customers need to be engaged, informed, empowered, vice versa. Utilities need to be engaged, informed on what customers can do. And that's how we'll empower them. So it's it's a lot about learning about each other, a lot about partnering with each other and sort of working effectively together. And again, last but not least, certainly is how do we make sure equity is there? Um, disadvantaged communities, DER owners, non-DER owners, they're all part of the electric system. How do we give them all equal access, equal cost, uh, sort of cost causation, cost allocation, whatever you want to call it. It's all part of this puzzle that, you know, customers are not uh, homogenous. There's a lot of difference in each customer class, customer set. And as the 200 plus people on this call, I'm sure can attest to like each of us are different. So how does the grid account for that differentiation in people is something important for us. So there's the last of my slides and I'll let Quinn take it from here and kind of deep dive into some of the more technical issues. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. I really appreciate that. And hello, my name is Quinn Nakayama. I'm the senior director for R&D here at PG&E. I'll try to see if I can raise the energy levels a little bit here. Hopefully you guys can all hear me. Why don't we go to the next slide? I think I have about like seven minutes to cover like two and a half hours worth of conversation here. So we'll see if I can get through this. Really what we're trying to demonstrate here is, listen, we think that distributed energy resources are gonna be a powerful force here in California and within all three IAU spaces to be able to really help with what's happening here in the state policy to be able to ensure we can decarbonize at the lowest cost possible. And as you can take a look at these two graphs that you see uh, on side by side, we think that behind the meter storage is going to have a large piece of this. But if you take a look at the slide to the right, like that is a crap ton of cars. And as we think about the plug-in availability of the cars over the next 30 years, you have this concept called anyways economics. You got to buy that EV anyways. 2035, every single car has to be an electric vehicle to kind of come off a lot. That is a lot of energy storage capability that both is a load and a flexible load. Like you can figure out when you're going to charge these cars. But moving down the future, we're starting to see a much more serious industry taking a look at two-way power flow technology. As customers are actually looking for being able to use their car as an energy resource and not just to be able to you know, minimize their bills, but we're seeing a significant push to even give them the capabilities to be able to back up their home during grid outages. And now we're taking a look at that. And then since we're gonna have the car anyways, can I use it for other things? The EVs, if you can take a look at the graph on the right, the growth pattern and the number of sheer gigawatt hours that are going to be on the actual uh, grid to be able to tap into is going to have an overweight impact that really needs to be carefully considered. Next slide. All right, so this is an Eiffel. I apologize, I get it. But what we really wanted to talk about is what are some of the use cases of which a DER may be able to really either facilitate the customer, support electrification, or support reliability. We try to put it in those three buckets. So really the first one is, you know, we'll take a look at these service transformers that are pole mounted surrounding our service territory. You know, there's a lot of customers who want level two charging um, at their homes, and we're going to see a much more bigger preponderance of that. However, we also know that L2 charging is flexible. Like when do customer charge actually makes a difference? And if they all charge it at one time during the very peak of the day, that service transformer is going to be overloaded. But if we can figure out how to manage that charge, flatten that load, the service transformer may not be needed to be upgraded immediately as soon as a new level two charger just uh, wants to come into play. Now that has pretty big ramifications on adoption of a level two of, of somebody who wants to have an EV. If they're working with utilities and over suddenly they need to upgrade that service transform, it's going to take four months. They may be more inclined to go buy a regular ICE vehicle. But if we can figure out ways to flatten out some of that charging so that service transformer doesn't need to be, you know, upgraded at that time and uh, we can weather through that, then what that enables is people will be able to access our grid with that level two charging need 
without having to do significant weight or cost. Now, there are risks and uncertainty of non-performance, right? If that doesn't happen, that service transformer may fail. And if that service transformer fails, well, then you have an outage condition affecting those 12 customers, 18 customers, and future customers who are going to be looking to try to get level two charging may now need to wait for a service transformer upgrade that definitely has some impacts. Another one is this flexible interconnection process. You heard a little bit about this. And one great example of this is high-speed fast charging. High-speed fast charging is looking to put a two megawatt or four megawatt fast charger right at this particular location. And there are constraints on that grid. But when you really peer into it, that constraint may only occur during this particular day in these particular hours in a particular year. And really what you can do is you can set schedules, real-time day ahead type schedules that enable you to say, okay, well, I know you want a four megawatts all the time, but tomorrow for these hours, maybe if you can just get two megawatts and be able to manage through the charging processes during that period of time, we can get you interconnected tomorrow, right? You don't have to wait for these long wires upgrades to be able to enable that capability. Now, some of the you know, risks and uncertainty is that if we still do overload the circuit because of non-performance, then an upstream device will operate and now 2000 customers are out of power. That becomes a pretty big problem for us. So those are some of the risks of uncertainty and non-performance that we cover around the flexible interconnection. Another piece is, hey, we all recognize there's gonna be heavy amounts of investment that are required for electrification. Don't get us any wrong. However, if we can figure out a way to flatten the load curves in certain situations, maybe those investments don't need to happen now. Maybe they can happen later. Um, and that really will help for electrification load growths that we have. Now, the risk of uncertainty there is if we can't get that particular behavior, if we can't get it to be flat, then what ends up happening is maybe that new business that wants to come in, those new EV loads, those new data centers, they won't be able to interconnect because there's not really that capacity that we thought there was going to be on that line. And now they need to wait. And they need to wait for a delayed wires investment that could have been in place. But now that we've kind of pushed it out, if it's not there, and now they have to wait even further. And that really hampers the state's goals for decarbonization and even economic growth. And if it doesn't happen and it overloads the circuit, now we're talking about local reliability issues and power quality. So you know, there are risks for uncertainty and non-performance in this area that we just need to be aware about. They're solvable, but we need to be aware about them. On local reliability, we won't get into too much detail because this gets really, you know, engineering focused, but we do have the ability to switch loads between circuit to circuit in order to be able to minimize outages for planned outages and pick up customers faster for unplanned outages. So really, you know, we can maybe be able to call upon these DERs to be able to lower load and be able to perform more aggressive switching. And on system reliability, we're already seeing this. This is already something that's available. DERs participating in wholesale markets and being able to participate in things like ELRP to be able to shave off those emergency conditions um, to be able to meet those high, high peak demands on the system. Next slide. Now, one of the issues that we run into is correlation, right? The system doesn't correlate actually to the things that happen below it. It does in some situations and most situations, but in other situations, it doesn't. You could get either zero correlation or even worse, negative correlation, where as you can see from the graph on the left, what you thought you needed from the system perspective actually is exactly the opposite of what you need at the local or the hyperlocal level. And this is where we as a DSO really need to figure out how do we orchestrate this all? so that we can meet system and hyper-local needs. And those areas that they conflict can be managed through so that we create reliability all the way from the hyper-local all the way to the system. Now, we need more tariffs and policies to determine how exactly do we do this orchestration and technology is gonna be a big part of that. And as we move into bigger and bigger DER EV related loads coming onto the system, this load profile may look significantly different at the distribution side than it does at the system side as we interconnect more solar, more energy storage, and more assets on the transmission side. Those profiles will start to really look different and we need to figure out ways that we can orchestrate that appropriately to meet all customers' needs. Next slide. And finally, we really gotta 
talk about this customer piece, right? I own a Tesla Model Y. Now it has a certain number of kilowatt hours inside of that, but how do our customers feel about using that car? It's one thing to say, well, let's figure out how you charge. That could have its own customer behavior related issues. But now you want to take energy out of my car? Energy out of my car for what, right? I need to be at work by tomorrow at seven o'clock in the morning. That sucker better be filled up. If you're going to be using it for other things, how am I getting comfortable with that? We already have range anxiety stories that are occurring just on using a car for transportation. And now you want to use it as an energy asset. How do customers feel? How do they engage? How do they feel empowered in this world? It's something that is still unknown. And then the other piece is it's going to change over time. It's going to rapidly change over time, right? EV battery capacity is going to have some step change developments over the years. The availability of high-speed fast chargers is also going to have a step change availability. And what you might say is, well, customer behavior today versus customer behavior five years down the road may look significantly different. And so toward that, what we really need is two things. We need, the, we need industry study. This is where how do customers really interact with their car? How do they feel about transportation? How do they feel about letting go of their electrons, about controlled charging? And then flexible program design, because we realize technology is going to continue to evolve. People's feelings are going to change. And we need program designs that are not set and in stone for five or 10 years, but knowing that customer behavior and customer engagement will change over time as people get more comfortable, as technology gets better, that they may actually change their behaviors as well. So really what we're saying here is, we need to do a lot of research to figure out what is the right way to engage it. Is it through rates? Is it dynamic? Is it locational? Is it one-time payment for X number of dispatches? How do customers feel? And how do we make sure that the way that we structure these programs is equitable for all customers, low income, the rich, live in the mountains, live in the beach communities, all of that needs to be factored in to be able to say, are we getting the necessary behaviors from these type of assets that'll best allow us to meet transportation electrification and the goals of the state at the lowest cost possible. So I was hoping I was able to run through that really quickly and apologize to San Diego if I take too much time, but let's go ahead and move on to San Diego who will wrap us up. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Kirsten. We're hearing you well. Okay. Apologies. Uh, my webcam got switched to the other side. Okay, we can work with that. All right. Well, excited to be here with you all today. Um, my name is Kirsten Peterson. I manage the control center over at San Diego Gas and Electric. So our team is responsible for the safe, reliable switching of SDG&E's distribution system. Um, I have the pleasure today of co-presenting with Chris. You are muted, Chris. My apologies, I thought I unmuted. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Franco. I'm the team lead in the Electric Distribution Operations Control Center at San Diego Gas and Electric. Uh, I specifically supervise the DSO trainees and work with our training department. Awesome. So Chris and I work closely alongside our distribution system operators, um, which has been interesting because it's given us a very direct connection to um, the opportunities um, and challenges within our current DER penetration in our system. So we're very excited today to speak to you about the operational needs that have been identified to meet customer expectations. All right. Um, so uh, we know operations were a bit simpler when the power flowed in one direction. Uh, as a utility, we were able to meet the needs of the grid and improve safety and reliability through investment in SCADA, sectionalizing and planning and forecasting tools. Uh, today, we're in a world of bi-directional power flow. Uh, to kick off this presentation, Devin shared that the impact from continued load growth and DER adoption inclusive of transportation electrification, building electrification, uh, net energy metering, and grid scale batteries, just to name a few. Uh, what we're seeing today will continue to grow in scale and complexity. 
and these changes call for increased capabilities of grid management systems and processes. Uh, PG&E, SCE, and us at sdg &E need to operate and manage the complexity of an increasingly dynamic system. And in working with each other, we recognize that solutions are not a one-size-fits-all. Um, what we all agree on is that as IOUs, we have an obligation and desire to enable the high DER and transportation electrification grid with providing the same or better uh, safety and reliability. Uh, next slide. Now, I want to elaborate a little bit on um, what capabilities these operational needs are calling for. So as you can imagine, the growing complexity of the grid, um, this brings the utility and distribution system operator a large amount of assets and data. Um, this is a lot to monitor, assess, analyze, manage. Um, and situational awareness has always and continues to be foundational to the success of distribution system operations. So with this increase in the number of assets and the data coming in in this high DER space, this really creates a challenge for visibility and for modeling um, for this future volume. So not only is there a need to digest this data, to analyze this data, um, but it's also really important that all of the estimated impacts um, are displayed and available in a way that's meaningful. So a format that allows for successful daily operations. Um, so one example of this is being able to differentiate mast load from the net node load that we might be viewing um, in an IDER space. So we view these, this data, these tools um, as something that needs to be like an operator assist um, rather than a barrier to operating the system. Um, another foundational uh, capability that we want to pick out is being able to establish uh, reliable and appropriate architecture for operational needs. So we need our communications to be reliable, um, we need appropriate telemetry control, which really enables um, scheduling load management capabilities. Um, and we want to make sure, too, that this architecture is streamlined from um, all the way from the grid edge to that control center, operation center. Um, so finally, to this point, as Quinn mentioned, the capability to balance needs across different operating levels will also be crucial um, as in the evolution of the grid. Um, so this grid orchestration really builds upon the data, the analytics um, actually being actionable. So even with our current volume of DERs, we've already started to see the needs for calculating dynamic ratings, um, dynamic charge limits, and the ability to detect problems in advance, um, such as potential overloads. So next slide, please. Um, and to uh, close out, I just, or to mentioned to you at the end of our presentation, we do have a, a summary that dives deeper into those points um, and where we recognize there is a need for more development. Um, so we can hover in the, on that at the end. In addition, those of you all have access to the slides and can reference it. Uh, yeah, that's like, sorry. yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, so you, you've heard the term uh, orchestration. It's been used throughout this presentation and it, it is an appropriate word for operating on the grid of the future. Um, regulatory requirements, contractual issues, the needs of the bulk electric system and the needs of the distribution system uh, need to be coming in at the right time. Uh, prioritize or deprioritize depending on the situation, all while being prepared in the case of emergencies or system events. Um, when conflicts arise, where will the deconflicting take place? This may be in the grid. And here it is especially important to reiterate maintaining the customer experience and reliability, which would require the capability to prioritize lower level needs over higher level needs when conflicts arise. All right, and next slide, please. And so we want to um, close out this presentation by touching on identified need that very much requires joint collaboration, asking the right questions. Um, so what will be the individual customer's role in the high DER future and how will they participate? Um, the past customer was a passive participant to rates, reliability, future customer may want to play an active role 
balancing energy needs, becoming savvy to the technology that makes the most sense for their situation. So how do we support them? We'll need to make sure a framework exists to communicate broad participation opportunities that clearly defines um, expectations, explanations of requirements, enrollment, any economic incentives. Um, and we really feel this tees us up to workshop number two, where we are going to look forward to addressing identified gaps that exist for us to achieve these operational needs for the successful IDER future. Um, so we definitely appreciate all of your time to discuss this. Um, we can go ahead and uh, click a couple slides forward to our appendix slide just to, to land on our summary. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and open up the floor for the audience for questions or comments. Great. Thanks very much, Kirsten, Chris, Quinn, Devin. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Jill, uh, California Independent System Operator. And then uh, if some time is available, we will take questions. Folks have questions, uh, clarifying or otherwise, for the utility presentation, go ahead and uh, log those in the meeting chat now so I can um, help get them fielded. Jill, are you ready to go? I am ready. Yes, sure. we can move forward. My name is Jill Powers. I am with the California ISO. Um, you can hear me great, right? I'm not double muted or anything. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, uh, Jill Powers, I work in our market policy and development group. I am a sector manager for this specific topic, demand response and distributed energy resources. And, you know, I didn't get a chance to review the, the um, utilities presentation be, be, um, for today, but I think it's great how GridWorks has set this, this um, panel up. Uh, because it really shows a bottom-up approach uh, to identifying the operational needs. Because my uh, presentation will really be looking at it from a, a much higher higher level, a somewhat higher level, and, and really representing, you know, all of the operational needs that are happening down. And, and the ISO recognizes there's a lot of um, operational coordination that's going on just within the distribution system before it actually comes up to that uh, operational coordination needs between the utilities and the ISO. So if we move to this, the we can move to our the next slide. It's really just providing a perspective. I'm not going to get into too much detail, but pr pr providing a uh, perspective of how, how the ISO is considering the variety of different scenarios under which DERs will be operating in the future. I think we've um, discussed that here today. Um, presently, the ISO is really kind of focused on these three broad use cases, broad use cases presenting themselves um, and really preparing um, to continue to manage the grid reliably and to operate the grid under these uh, different types of scenarios. Um, and, and this includes DERs responding, as we heard earlier, to signals that may be grid informed through the dynamic rates um, and flexible, uh, flex flexible load options um, and controlled in a way that meets those individual customer needs. We're also anticipating growth in aggregations of DERs that just act as virtual power plants, that they can participate directly in the ISO's wholesale markets and provide uh, transmission services, or they're going to be dispatched um, as needed by the distribution system operator, or even just being um, utilized by the customers in, 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 in the, way, the manner that they deemed um, most fits their needs. Um, and lastly, we expect to see a continued growth in DERs that just will operate independently. Um, they may be somewhat inflexible and they're not gonna be responding to these external signals, uh, maybe not even um, rates um, or through definitely through not through any dispatch signal. So these are the kind of these scenarios in which we understand that there's going to be um, need for, we'll go to the next slide. Um, they're gonna impact the ISO in different ways and we're going to require um, different transmission and distribution operations collaborations as well as system advancements in, in order to be able to collaborate the, in the ways and uh, coordinate in the ways that we need to. 
Um, and we've kind of identified three um, specific areas in which we would like to see advancement. We know we need to see con continued collaboration and we're going to ultimately ultimately need um, direct coordination with um, distribution system operate, operators in these areas. Um, and I think the utilities brought many of these up, um, the DER visibility and also for situational awareness. Uh, we need to have this coordination um, for reliability purposes and we need advancements in communication as well as data sharing. And if we go to the next slide, um, I want to kind of give a little bit more about coordination of the visibility of DER information as needed. Um, and we need to understand what DER and where the DER, DER is, um, because we do anticipate their impacts. Uh, there will be see, we will see impacts on system, um, transmission system grid operations. I know it's a pretty broad statement and we'll need to kind of work on uh, defining all those specific data needs, um, and, but we have have some ideas on what, what that would look like. Um, pretty much like large scale resources, it's critical to have resource specific information such as location, technology type, capacity values, minimum and maximum. Um, what kind of monitoring, system monitoring on these, different customer types. So these are the type of information we've already kind of started to identify as, as being needed. Um, and, and why is it being, why is it needed? Well, it's, it's needed um, for planning, um, for forecasting processes, and in, to really improve the uh, grid asset utilization. Um, as we use it for short-term load forecasting accuracy, and this will go into our ISO market optimization and, and dispatch. So I have kind of in the red, the need for operational forecasting data. We need that data to understand how DERs are acting and how they're responding when they are dispatched. Um, the next Next one is just kind of an uh, identification of that situational awareness that's needed um, because with greater visibility comes greater operator situational awareness of both the DERs that are participating in the markets and providing services and those that aren't participating but yet supplying load. So just as an example, I threw up here um, you know, what we've seen from behind the meter solar and how it's been um, the most in, impactful DER, and again, these are non-participating DERs for the ISO um, operation standpoint thus far. Um, we've seen, you know, rapid movement of demand actuals when we see this DER that is supplying that load um, generation drop off, um, and this is due to the uh, forecast of the cloud coverage that's coming in, and that's why there is this need to understand where these are, what is there, um, the capacity that is out there on the system, the distribution system, because impacts like that, the 725 megawatt increase in load, um, does now percolate up to um, needing some imp uh, being impactful to transmission operations. So it, it, it's important to understand the impact of all types of DERs, not just the solar, which is our most impactful to date. And we, we need to understand this under a variety of different uses um, at, for reliability purposes. And I, I think Quinn touched on this expectation of um, transportation electrification. We think now that's gonna move that, um, advance that forward to some of the most impactful things that we'll be seeing on the, the grid and, and it being, you know, bringing greater complexity to the need to have that visibility and to the, do this forecasting of what we might see in operational timeframes um, so that our operators do have that situational awareness. And um, the third item, we'll go to the next slide, really just on the overall reliability coordination between distribution system and the transmission system. Um, recognizing that the ISO does not model the distribution system, 
Um, we can't ensure uh, resource dispatch through a wholesale market award um, or con control through our EMS system, providing those type of services is, is safe or even feasible um, to the distribution system. So we have to have some real-time type coordination as to feasibility of resources, distributed energy resources that may be providing transmission services. Uh, additionally, again, brought up the fact we have to anticipate how the operation of non-market participating DERs may impact the tra transmission system. So what's needed within the reliability coordination umbrella, really a framework to coordinate the operation of these DER resources when they're providing services not only to the ISO um, bulk electric system, but also if and when they become um, providing services to the to the distribution system, um, and really the, the coordination is to ensure that there is feasibility of those services and to preserve reliability. And last uh, of the three items um, beyond the initial visibility into the deployment of DERs of where and when. Um, there's a growing need for communication of the operations of or the restrictions to operations of DERs within those operational timeframes that we tend to look at the day ahead, real time, um, leading up to the provision of services. Um, really needing the communication uh, between the grid operators, not just the grid operators, but also between the, the operators as well as aggregators and our scheduling coordinators. So what's needed here is that communication platform, information sharing framework. I think uh, it was touched on as really this orchestrated system, this, this system that is orchestrating this type of communication between the operators in the appropriate time frame. Um, giving status of DERs, the feasibility, their activity in relation to grid operations um, or reliability. So lastly, I, I think this is a, just a summary, um, and I think I've touched on all of these uh, different aspects of why we need advancement in these different areas, visibility, reliability, communication, um, advancement in the process, potentially advancement in, in policies, as well as we definitely see advancements needed in, in system and system orchestration of this type of information sharing and coordination. So that's it for me. Great, thank you so much, Jill, for getting us finished on time. We have a two minutes before we're going to move on to our thought leaders panel and uh, that is a hard stop for us we have some special guests calling from abroad and we want to be respectful of their schedule and time um, but there are a number of questions that have been shared for both the utilities and the iso in the chat <clears throat> so i want to invite uh, devin quinn kirsten uh, jill uh, please scroll through the chat, and if you see a question there that feels addressed to you, if you have a chance to respond to it, feel comfortable responding to it in the okay. chat, go for it. And then if we have a little bit more time uh, later in the afternoon, we may come back to sort of raise some of these questions for discussion with you all. But we will wrap the panel for now and say thank you to um, U5 again for the hard work you put into preparing for this panel and sharing these good ideas with us. All right, Jay, I'm going to turn it over to you to let us get started with our thought leader panel. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Again, I just want to check in with my co-panelists here, make sure we have everyone online and on time. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to do intro, uh, short introductions. Uh, we're very honored to have, actually, I think I've calculated we're spanning about half the globe in timeline. Uh, uh, time zones today. We have folks on the East Coast, all the way through the West Coast, and throughout the Pacific here on this panel. Um, we're honored to have Jenny Reese, who is the manager of the Operational DER Management Department from the Australian Energy Market Operator. Um, she has a great presentation prepared, and I think we'll um, 
I like for folks here, the art of the possible, where California and other parts of the U.S. are headed. Um, they're already taking on these challenges today in Australia. Uh, so we'll see some of that. Next up will be Brian Hannigan, uh, the president and CEO of Holy Cross Energy in Colorado. It's a, a member-owned cooperative in Colorado. Uh, Brian will be sharing the, his utilities plans uh, for high DER future that's well underway already. Uh, and we also have Debbie Liu, who is the associate director of the Energy Systems Integration Group, uh, who has been a, a long time uh, analyst of renewable systems integration. Uh, and we'll be offering perspectives uh, from ESIG and experiences in the United States with high DER the operational needs. I think we're gonna move uh, through each presentation and then uh, if people can place their questions in the chat. And again, we wanna refresh uh, opportunities to share your thoughts on operational needs in the Slido app. Uh, we'll save the discussion for at the tail end of the three presentations. Um, so if we can first move to, Maggie, if we can move to Jenny's presentation. I believe we have Jenny, so thanks Hi, for joining everybody. us. Just confirm you can hear me, Jay? Yeah, coming through Fantastic. loud and clear. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Uh, wonderful to be with you this morning for me. You just jump to the next slide, please. So just briefly about us at AEMO, the Australian Energy Market Operator. Uh, so we operate the electricity grids on the national electricity market on the whole east coast of Australia, as well as the wholesale electricity market on the west, uh, and also operate the gas markets. And I'm going to talk to you a lot today about the uh, experiences in the NEM on the east coast of Australia. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of context for scale, um, this shows you Australia overlaid on the United States, and I've put California there. Um, I'm going to talk to you a lot about the South Australian region, which I've circled down the bottom there. Um, that region in geographical scale is not dissimilar to California. Uh, but much smaller electrical load. Um, it ranges between about one to three gigawatts of underlying load in that region of the grid. It is connected synchronously to the rest of the national electricity market, but only relatively weakly um, through one double circuit AC interconnector. And that interconnector um, can be lost and in unplanned outages on occasion. Uh, that's typically happened in the past, maybe once per year or so, we'll have a double circuit loss and we have to operate South Australia as an island um, synchronously on its own. Next slide, please. This is showing you the levels of distributed photovoltaics that we've got to in South Australia. So just recently on New Year's Eve, um, 31st of December, just gone, uh, we reached a new record where the total net demand in South Australia was negative 26 megawatts. So that was 102% of the demand in South Australia uh, supplied by distributed photovoltaics by which I mean uh, rooftops, essentially. We're talking five kilowatt rooftop systems supplying more than 100% of the demand in the grid in South Australia. Um, that means it's backfeeding from the distribution network and supplying uh, industrial loads. We have a number of um, large mines and other industrial customers in South Australia, all of whom were being supplied by those mums and dads rooftops, um, up to about 1.2 gigawatts of total demand there. So. Uh, historic record um, and um, a lot that we've been learning from looking at this day. Next slide, please. So I've just summarized on this slide um, a number of learnings to date, I guess, or things that I would reflect on um, if I was starting afresh in terms of um, working towards achieving successful operation with really high levels of distributed PV. Um, and many of these are issues that we're continuing to work on. The first one there, um, really underpinning everything, is the technical performance standards, particularly making sure that we have appropriate standards in place um, for disturbance ride-through capabilities. Uh, we found that we did not in our previous 2015 version of the Australian standards. So we had a, quite a process to update that um, and get that out in the field. 
We've then since found that compliance with that new standard is very poor. So very important to measure and ensure suitable compliance with the standards. It's been quite a process since about uh, 2019 and still going to, to try and get those standards applied and properly compliant in the field. Number two is around dispatchability. Um, so we raised the alarm bell relatively early on, uh, back around 2017 or so, um, noting that we were going to hit periods where we were supplying almost all of the energy across the grid from distributed photovoltaics, and that in order to manage those periods, especially under outage conditions, it would be crucial that we can manage the active power from that those distributed resources, and that at the time there was no ability to do that. Um, it's been quite a long journey to get that capability in place. We now have that what we call emergency backstop capability um, to be able to curtail active power from mums and dads rooftops at scale in South Australia um, and we're working on that across the rest of the grid as well. Longer term, we'll be iterating towards integrating distributed photovoltaics into our scheduling and dispatch systems um, so that we can develop all of the more sophisticated capabilities that we'll need longer term. Um, but uh, that's very much something where we're trying to start simple and learn by doing, just getting some simple capabilities in first and then iterating towards more sophisticated um, integration. Third is around uh, visibility um, and making sure that we've got adequate data that can then feed into developing adequate power system models. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the data sets um, that we've needed, uh, but really crucial to think about that early and start collecting them and make sure they're accurate because we've had a lot of problems with um, poor data quality. We're also seeing a need for roles and responsibilities evolving. Uh, one of the really key ones that's come out is that the original equipment manufacturers are really critically important. And we're spending a lot of time engaging with them in ways that uh, we would not typically. Normally, we'd be working with market participants who have responsibility for their assets. And if needed, they might go back to the manufacturers to ask for further information about their equipment. But we're finding a system operator, we're now dealing very much directly uh, with those original equipment manufacturers because essentially there is no market participant who's offering bids and, and engaging with uh, us as the system operator. So that's causing a lot of challenges given that that role is not entirely clearly defined and not something that they're used to fulfilling. Also challenges around things like customer metering. Um, there's a device at every customer site that's highly capable of delivering a lot of functions that we need. Uh, a lot of these new capabilities are technically possible, but customer metering has never been used in that way before. And there's a lot of governance challenges around unlocking those capabilities. The final one there is around uh, cybersecurity, uh, which is definitely a growing concern and one that we're continuing to work through um, how we address that. So I'll touch on that. That's sort of your summary of all of the, the high level. I'll touch on some of these in a little bit more depth with some examples. If we can jump to the next slide. So firstly, this underpinning capability of disturbance ride through, um, we discovered this, this is actually one of the original examples that we discovered back in 2017. Um, there was uh, in, in South Australia, again, um, a series of explosions at one of our large gas fired power stations, which led to voltages dropping very low right in the middle of the main capital, Adelaide, uh, where there is a lot of, a very large concentration of distributed PV. Um, you can see on the right there where that fault happened on the transmission network and the vol minimum voltage is recorded about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 per unit. In response to that, we saw a very large proportion of the distributed PV trip off. Uh, within a 50 kilometer radius, it was about half of the PV that tripped um, and extending right out to about 250 kilometers away, which covers a lot of the state. If that's not addressed, um, that can become a very major security problem um, over the longer run with very large amounts of PV potentially disappearing. Um, if you have a, a trip of a station, you can lose a lot of PV with it. Um, so it increases the credible contingency sizes that we have to manage with frequency reserves and so on, um, and also has flow on effects for stability limits and so on. So we initiated this process back in 2019 to improve our ride through standards. Uh, we were informed a lot by the process that had been recently concluded with IEEE 1547. So we're able to draw a lot of learnings from that. Um, so we, we then were able to get in place our new Australian standard um, for 777 2020. 
the challenge since then has been that uh, only about 40% of the new systems being installed appear to be compliant with those new standards, uh, which means that even though the new standard looks to be sufficient um, to define adequate ride through, uh, they're not being installed correctly on that new standard. So we still have essentially the same problem. We've managed to improve that to about 80% compliance just by working with the original equipment manufacturers who have enormous influence over the way that installers engage with their products when they're installed. And by setting defaults and removing old standards and making it much easier for the installers at the point of commissioning, they've been able to improve that uh, compliance rate considerably. We also are working on improved governance around this to make sure that there is clear roles and responsibilities defined around who should be doing exactly what and checking exactly what when to make sure that that compliance is high. Um, so I'd say this, if you only pick one issue to worry about and get right, it would be this one, uh, because if you don't get this right, it flows on to an enormous number of other security problems um, and operational problems. Uh, but if you can get this right, then everything will go much more smoothly. Next slide, please. This uh, example here is uh, talking about an incident that we had uh, just in late 2022. Um, there was severe weather around the interconnector that led to a separation event and South Australia operating as an island. Because of damage to the transmission lines, um, it was operating for an island as an island for about a week um, from the 12th to the 19th of November. And that included operation through some periods of extremely high levels of distributed PV operation. Um, we had to curtail this, this was um, using our ability to curtail PV um, in practice um, for about a week. And you can see on the right there the operational demand or the net demand levels that we were measuring for South Australia. The teal colour is what was forecast and the purple is the actuals. And you can see that we've um, trimmed off the, the troughs uh, by curtailing distributed PV through the middle of each day. Um, the dash lines there are the targets that AEMO was instructing our network providers to meet. So we were curtailing off about 400 to 600 megawatts of PV throughout some of those really high PV days. The main security risk we were worried about here was while we were operating an island, um, there is the potential for a fault in the middle of Adelaide that would cause a trip of a unit plus a very large amount of PV disconnecting. And we didn't have adequate frequency reserves to be able to manage that in that island condition um, and maintain our frequency standards. So the only option we had available to us was to curtail down the PV. So it's harking back to the previous issue. If you can solve the disturbance ride through issues in the standards, then this issue would be much diminished. Most of this response was delivered by the DNSP, a distribution network provider, through what they call enhanced voltage management, um, which they're using to increase their distribution voltages to about 1.03, 1.04 per unit to deliberately trip off PV generation in these periods. And that was implemented as a last resort mechanism. It's obviously not ideal to be increasing distribution voltages higher than nominal, uh, but it was a last resort mechanism put in place to deal with a lot of these legacy PV systems that didn't have any active controls. In this event, it was extremely effective. It delivered the response that we needed um, and it absolutely was a crucial lever to have even our toolkit to maintain security in these periods. In parallel with that, we have attempted to put in what's called a smarter homes requirements where customers appoint a relevant agent who manages their PV when required. Um, that has been put in place, but unfortunately, we're only seeing 40% compliance. Again, compliance being the problem. Um, the biggest erosion of responses from the systems not being set up properly at the point of commissioning. Um, so SA Power Networks is working with their original equipment manufacturers to improve that response rate. Next slide, please. So just emphasizing again this point, we've been trying to put in place this emergency backstop capability, which you really do need this early. Um, it's something that can be quite simple and you really just need the ability to turn off very large amounts of PV if necessary in a security event. That's quite separate in my mind from the full integration of DER into markets. I know there's a lot of talk all over the place around dynamic operating envelopes and distributors being able to have this nuanced control in their distribution network limits and so on. Absolutely, we need to go there, but that's going to be a long journey to get that working properly. And well ahead of that, we've needed to have this um, very relatively more crude and simple capability to just turn off bulk PV for a security issue. So, and that's helping us with a lot of learnings as well um, in working towards that more sophisticated capability.
Next slide, please. Just to note also on visibility um, of distributed resources, um, we, it's crucial to have much expanded data sets um, to really inform all of the analysis that we're doing. It underpins the model development, um, checking that things are maintaining performance requirements, just understanding what they're doing on the grid. The example that I've shown here is a major incident that occurred on the 25th of May, 2021. Um, in the southern part of Queensland, you can see where there's those red and black dots in the, the graph about halfway up the coast of Australia. Um, we had uh, multiple explosions at some coal-fired power stations that led to voltage dips on the grid. You can see on the right there the minimum per unit voltages that were recorded across different uh, levels of distribution and transmission. And you can see in the bubbles on the left the amount of PV that we saw responding in different ways uh, with the blue systems riding through, which is the desired behaviour, um, the black systems disconnecting, which is the undesired behaviour because they're exacerbating what was a very severe underfrequency event. And the red bubbles are ones that were disconnected by underfrequency load shedding, uh, which was triggered in response to this very severe underfrequency event, but in those places was disconnecting a lot of distributed PV as well as load. Um, so we have another piece of work that's looking at how do we improve that underfrequency load shedding design so that it's not tripping off generation in an underfrequency event. To do this kind of analysis requires enormous new data sets. Um, you need device level monitoring from a sample of inverters, uh, which is how we produce that figure on the left. Uh, we need much improved monitoring of voltages, um, high speed monitoring across the grid of an active and reactive power, uh, which was data sets used to produce the figure on the right. Um, and you need to know the install capacity of PV at each transmission bus, uh, which is highly non-trivial as well. Um, just, just three data sets that we have some patchy coverage, but we're working hard to try and improve those data sets because they're so crucial in underpinning everything that we're doing. Next slide, please. So just I've given you a very brief taste of some of the work we're doing, uh, a lot more information on our website if you just look for AEMO and DER operations. Thanks for having me here. Jenny, thank you very much for your participation. Um, we're going to move to Brian next. Uh, people, please, again, feel free to uh, pose your questions in the chat. Hopefully Jenny can hang on through the end of our time here, but um, really appreciate your willingness to share your experiences here for the stakeholders in California. Maggie, if we, there we go. We have Brian ready. Oh, see yep. you. Up. Hi, Jay. And Hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be, everybody. I'm Brian Hannigan. I'm president and CEO of Holy Cross Energy. We're one of 22 uh, electric cooperatives here in the state of Colorado. Um, my nexus to you all is that I am originally from Southern California. I've got family uh, in the area. And uh, for a long time I studied and uh, worked in California. So it's a great pleasure to be uh, back providing some input into the great things that are going on in my home state. I wanna open up by associating myself and the folks here in Colorado working on DERs with all of the excellent comments that have been made so far, particularly the comments from the joint IOUs and from uh, AMO, from Jenny uh, and her presentation a moment ago. Um, we learn regularly as utilities from one another and we're very quick to steal best practices um, and set aside those things that don't work. And so a lot of what um, we're looking at here in Colorado with respect to DERs um, learns a lot from the experiences around the world. If I can get the next slide. Um, to put things in perspective, Holy Cross Energy is about 1 60th the size of Southern California Edison. So we are a primarily distribution operator that does own some transmission with roughly 60,000 meter delivery points, 46,000 cooperative members or customers. Um, the key thing that distinguishes Holy Cross is that our communities that we serve in the mountains of Western Colorado, about two hours west of Denver on the I-70 corridor. Um, there's some very scenic outdoor recreation focused communities, uh, skiing, hunting, fishing, hiking, biking, you name it, um, our members do it. And so they're very focused on climate change and they've set for the cooperative as member owners, a goal of achieving 100% carbon-free electricity in our supply by the end of this decade. Um, at the end of 2023, as you can see there, we're up to 50%. Um, at the end of 23, we had some new projects come online, which I'll highlight in a moment. 
uh, that will take us in on an hourly basis um, during the solar production hours to anywhere between 75 and 95% carbon free electricity in any hour of the day. Um, and so we're beginning to live the fabled last 20% of decarbonization of the electric system that so many analysts and, and, and thought leaders have written and spoken about. So again, we're about 1 60th the size of uh, the larger IOUs in California, but I think the, the challenges are, are common. They just may differ in scale. Next slide. Uh, so we laid out in 2019 a, a plan to get to 100% carbon-free power supply by 2030 and to become carbon neutral or better across our entire enterprise. So all scopes, one, two, and three by 2035. Um, investing in energy efficiency uh, at, a, at a first priority, developing cleaner wholesale power supplies, investing strongly in local clean energy resources and, and, and DERs, and I'll say more about that in a moment, and then uh, smart electrification. We recognize that our member owners, our consumers, are going to be placing PV on their rooftops of their homes and their businesses. They're going to be increasingly driving electric They'll be using heat pumps for heating uh, in the winter season and increasingly due to climate impacts, cooling in the summer season, even though we're in the mountains as well. So how do we get those distributed resources to be grid friendly, grid compatible, and to actually see them as part of our overall power supply uh, and our ability to run a reliable grid to balance the supply and demand for electricity in all locations and at all times? Next slide. So at the end of 2023, we took delivery of the two resources that were previously under contract in Eastern Colorado, uh, a 150 megawatt wind farm. It's actually 200 megawatts. Uh, our share is 150 of that. It's the Bronco Plains 2 project east of Denver. We also share with another electric cooperative 30 new megawatts of utility scale solar. And as you see below, we're already developing or have developed a variety of local resources within our own service area, again, in the mountains, in mountain valleys, uh, particularly on customer sites at distribution voltage. You can see there uh, the first of many, what we see as, as part of our portfolio, solar plus battery storage projects uh, that are deploying at distribution, which provide some very useful balancing to the resources that we're pulling from the grid, but also the resources that we are utilizing from our consumers, such that by the time we get into next year, 2025, um, our system will be mostly powered by wind and by solar um, with a few other renewables in there uh, and the residual makeup of market power um, coming primarily from coal and natural gas. And the question for us, like a lot of those who are on the call is, how do we close that gap and what role can distributed energy resources owned and potentially operated by our consumer members, um, what role do they play in helping us close that gap? Next slide. So one of the challenges that we've talked about for most of the presentations this afternoon, but what I wanted to show graphically, even on a small system, we are beginning to see the impacts, uh, particularly as we look ahead to this year and beyond. Um, we have our own version in Colorado of the duck curve. Um, we call it the, the Sopris Curve in honor of our local mountains that look a little bit like that uh, peak there that you see in the middle of the day. Um, the gray and the pink are residual power supply resources that we're currently making up from wholesale providers, including our balancing area authority, the Public Service Company of Colorado. Obviously, that comes with a cost. That comes with some optionality to it. Um, and they themselves, both Guzman and Piesco as our wholesalers, have increasingly uh, variable renewable resource powered portfolios. And so you can only imagine if we are a customer with net demands on uh, the balancing authority and we're, we're not in an organized market. So in this case, Piesco functions as our functional equivalent to the CAISO in terms of being the, um, the, the balancing area authority. Um, they are going to be increasingly challenged by distribution customers like us who are asking for more and variable power supply to balance our own needs as those change over time. In general, what you see is, as shown here, oversupply of solar during the midday, oversupply of wind during the overnight hours when demand is low, 
And then for us in the peaks, in the mornings and in the afternoons, we see undersupply there. So obviously long duration energy storage is a big deal, but also flexibility of demand as well as flexibility of supply when coupled with stored energy. Increasingly, we're seeing this on a locationally distributed basis. And so that again, lends itself an opportunity for DERs. Next slide. So we very much believe in the power of distributed resources to minimize our needed upgrades to the distribution system. Um, I think Quinn from the Joint Utilities uh, mentioned this very clearly in their presentation. This is some work that we've done with RMI, formerly the Rocky Mountain Institute, that's based in our service territory, um, just to look at how one could take a very wavy net load profile represented by the dotted lines here with minima in the morning hours and in the peak solar days and maxima during the traditional peaks, similar to what Jenny showed for AMO uh, a moment ago. But this would be at a distribution level. Um, how can we use plug loads and air conditioning and commercial heat and vehicles and all the things um, to manage that wavy net load profile to something that was more levelized and predictable and frankly happier from a distribution system operator standpoint um, because our systems are built to run in steady state and they are at their most reliable when they run in steady state. So we see DERs as providing important services to help balance the supply and demand, not just over time, but over location as well. And, and several of these points have been made previously by the folks here speaking previously. Next slide. So, and this is my last one, and I'll park on this for a little bit, because as we thought about reflecting on the operational requirements um, of running a higher DER future, um, and to put that in context, our, our high DER future, for us, that means 25 megawatts of behind the meter solar PV capacity on a summer peak load of 150 megawatts. Um, we are deploying roughly four to five megawatts of solar plus an equivalent amount of capacity of battery storage every year through programs such as our Power Plus program that offers zero money down, 0% financing for behind the meter battery storage with a monthly credit in exchange for the utility's ability to operate the battery as a grid asset within certain agreed upon parameters in the contract with the customer. We're looking at expanding that to heat pumps, and we expect those to deploy quite quickly, um, given our community's desire for climate action and to move off of natural gas for heating. Um, and we provide free level two chargers to any co-op member that wants them. Um, the full rebate uh, occurs in exchange for our ability to manage the V1G charging rate. And when bi-directional chargers become commercially available and integrated with our energy management systems, we'll be handing those out as well and looking forward to bi-directional charging in the same way that we dispatch and communicate with the battery storage. So there are lots of things that are needed to accomplish that. As you heard a moment ago from Jenny, visibility, whether you're a grid operator at the transmission level or at the distribution level, is absolutely important, as well as situational awareness. Um, one of the challenges that we found is outside of our normal prolonged uh, interconnection process, according to some stakeholders, we're not able to know exactly where the DERs are being built and where they're being connected and where the upgrades have to occur. So if there's some way using data that we can detect the existence of a distributed PV system or a new battery that's been installed, we can reach out to the consumer and offer them participation in one or more of our voluntary pricing or programs. Secondly, fast, secure, and private communications infrastructure, especially in the rural areas. We are not putting in fiber like other cooperatives to provide last mile internet service to the house. We're putting in fiber to make sure that we can communicate with all the edge devices that are being deployed on our system and to do so in a way that is fast and secure and private. And part of the privacy may occur in communicating directly with a meter or a grid controller at the premise that does all of the coordination and optimization, or as we've heard previously, orchestration of the DERs that exist behind the meter in a way that is somewhat blind to the utility except for the net transfer of energy and services across the metering interface so that it preserves the privacy of the con consumer as to whether it's the battery 
or the vehicle or the heater that's providing those grid services. At some level, the utility, the distribution utility really doesn't care what it is so long as it provides the necessary services that are being requested. That leads me to the third point, grid responsive and more importantly, interoperable hardware devices. In our early interactions with particular devices and vendors, um, we all are seeing a number of closed ecosystems with vendor specific APIs that aren't able to interact with one another. And they may actually be tethered to operating systems that themselves are proprietary. But as we all know, you can't legislate or regulate consumer behavior. And there's no guarantee that a consumer seeking a battery is going to get the one and only vendor for which your DMS or your DRMS, your management systems are, are able to converse. So a bigger industry-wide effort, um, both on the standpoint of consumers and utilities in their requests for proposals and programs and partnerships, but also on the industry itself to develop a single interoperable set of, of hardware interfaces, almost like a USB port for DERs would be absolutely valuable and would speed the adoption and the integration of those DERs. Um, when I say grid responsive, again, we're thinking about pricing signals, not unlike the Southern California Edison pilot project um, that, that looked at more dynamic rates. We're also looking at control signals. Um, I will say that our early experience has shown more interaction and value with our member consumers when we pay them a monthly bill credit and reduce the on-tariff bill payment for the DER by the value of the grid services that they're allowing it to provide to us. Um, Event-specific payments seem to be less effective based on our earlier example. I spoke a moment ago about software optimization platforms, and I put in parentheses there multiple levels. You see in the graphic, the advanced distribution management system, which helps us manage the distribution system and all of the devices connected to it to enable the flow of power across uh, the, the delivery function. That has to interact with the signaling mechanisms and the bill crediting for the DERs in a DER management system. And as I hinted at earlier, that may interact with a increasingly smarter meter that's not just capable of functioning as a cash register, but it's also capable of functioning as a microgrid controller that is able to operate and orchestrate the DERs even when it doesn't detect a line voltage on the, on the high side of the meter. In other words, during an outage. We regularly hear from our consumers, I bought PV for energy resilience purposes. Why won't it work when the distribution grid is out? Great question. Something that when we think about ourselves as distribution system operators that provide energy services and not utilities that provide energy as a commodity, that motivates us to make sure that we keep the lights on no matter whether it's our grid, their grid, or a combination of the two. Lastly, I'll talk about innovative programs and equitable financing options. Um, in our service territory, we have seen the uptake of DERs preferentially by those with the economic means to self-finance, those with the leisure time, I should say, to do the research. We have not seen them by the working poor and the service economy on which most of our service territory resides. So we look at a variety of ways to balance this playing field everything from on tariff financing with no money down and 0% financing so that the consumer does not need to have discretionary capital in order to acquire the DER. They can pay for it over time with those bill credits added on for the services that it provides. We also are looking at graduated rebates and perhaps even different rate structures for those consumers who are income qualified. We have a very robust community solar program where if you're not able to install, install solar and increasingly storage as well, you can power your premise with storage and solar located in your community, in your neighborhood, at your HOA. Um, and so there are opportunities to, to think about equity um, in that aspect. And then finally, the last bullet point not shown on the screen is the utility business model. And this again is where I'll come back to thinking about the utility as a distribution system operator, as a deliverer of electrons from point A to point B, 
in a world where every home and every business can be an independent power producer. Um, it is no longer sufficient for the utility to rely on the commodity sales of kilowatt hours as a way of financing the investments in the infrastructure. It just simply doesn't work when people have the option to generate their kilowatt hours themselves or in a state like California where community choice um, and competition um, are, are part of the fabric. And we see that increasingly becoming the case in states like Colorado. My last point is this, and that is our mental model of how we're operating our distribution system at Holy Cross Energy is that we are to our retail customers of all shapes and sizes, the grid operator at retail, the same way that the Kaiso or the AMO are at wholesale to their distribution system customers. They are the grid operator of the bulk power. They are the balancer. They are the reliability coordinator at retail, at lower voltages on the network. That is our role. And so our whole business model really needs to be rethought in a high DER environment. And our incentive structure for Holy Cross, that's as a nonprofit, our key performance indicators, our performance-based regulation, our rates, our programs, you name it, really needs to be rethought for what that means in a high DER future. Um, and that work is well underway. And we look forward to learning and sharing um, as we go on this last slide, shared clean energy journey together. Um, and that's uh, where I'll leave it. I look forward to your comments and questions. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, first, thanks for your leadership and participation here today. Um, we encourage everyone to continue with your uh, questions, comments in the chat. Also, please um, feel free to use, uh, continue to use the Slido app. We have that open, encourage participation there. In the meantime, we're going to tee up our last presentation from Debbie Liu. And I know we have some questions in the chat, um, some to Brian and I think one to Jenny. Maybe if we can try and, if you guys want to take a look and tackle those while we go. Um, otherwise, we'll try and see what time's left over. Debbie, please go ahead. Sure. Thanks so much, Jay. And thanks for inviting me. Really happy to speak with all of you. So I'm going to talk about um, considerations for really high levels of different types of DERs. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, so Brian just mentioned that, you know, utilities, um, it's great for utilities to learn from each other. Uh, ESIG, our, our group, Energy Systems Integration Group, brings together utilities to learn from each other and uh, really happy to be able to bring together people like uh, Jenny and Brian and 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 uh, the other folks who are speaking to uh, uh, learn from each other as to best practices and um, solve technical challenges towards decarbonization. Um, so a couple of years ago, we had a task force um, uh, looking at DER integration into wholesale markets and operations, lessons learned from the UK and Australia, and transitions to a high DER system. I know there's folks on the uh, phone today, including Lorenzo, who will speak later, who are part of this um, effort and encourage you to um, take a look at this, this link to uh, access these reports. So if you go to the next slide, um, I was asked to talk today about operational needs, and I think um, everyone's sort of explained this already. It's really important to have visibility and to provide control. And um, so it's that look ahead, the monitoring, and being able to control that um, is what the system operator does every day. And um, we've already talked about the need to forecast loads and resources. Um, we've talked a little bit less about positioning the system um, and then the real-time balance. But this visibility and an understanding of the behavior of the DERs, which I think will become increasingly more complex. I mean, today, if it's rooftop solar, that's pretty easy to forecast. Tomorrow, if it's behind the meter storage and different people have different use cases as to how they use their storage, then understanding the behavior becomes um, more difficult. And uh, so I, I will also add that this visibility of the DERs, it doesn't have to be the Cal ISO role, it could be some other um, entity's role that could then feed um, the forecast up to the Cal ISO. Uh, and I, I won't go through this um, little analogy that I had because I know we're a little bit short on time, but um, 
I wanted to say that if we want high levels of DERs to be a big part of the balancing solution, we need them to be visible, controllable, and reliable. And the great thing about DERs is I can aggregate lots of small DERs and they can act just like a large resource. And I don't need to build some big uh, you know, gigawatt scale resource on the transmission system. But the risky thing about DERs, and I think Jenny showed this really well, is that in aggregate, they can act just like a large resource. And so we need to be really thoughtful and consider what that behavior looks like. So if you go to the next slide, um, DER impacts um, could show up in things like reserve requirements. So for example, Jenny was talking about um, the common mode tripping of many megawatts of rooftop solar. And uh, you know, if you're tripping so many megawatts that it's larger than the single largest contingency that you've planned for, you know, this can have reliability implications more so than just small frequency deviations. Um, in addition, large changes in DER consumption or generation can increase the need for regulation reserves. And just as an example, ERCOT has already seen uh, large loads overwhelm the amount of regulation up and regulation down that they hold. Now, of course, large loads are not the same as DERs, but it just shows the implications of what DER aggregations acting as one resource can, can be. So uh, system operators are always balancing cost and reliability. And um, some folks may may argue and say, well, technically, you know, you maybe you don't need as much visibility. Maybe you don't need super accurate forecasts. Maybe AI is going to learn all of this stuff for you. And, you know, technically that may be true, but you may also just end up paying more for reserves. And how much more is going to depend on what people are installing, how much and how they're operating it. And again, um, uh, depending on... Um, different types of events, it could lead to reliability issues in the end. So having that visibility, having that reliability, and having that controllability for DERs um, is an important uh, pathway towards cost-effective um, uh, costs for ratepayers in the end. So if you go to the next slide, fundamentally, um, what we're talking about is, you know, how do we manage the DERs? And prior to any management of DERs, so like that third category that Jill showed of, you know, not managing DERs, we've got this natural diversity. And the natural diversity across loads is a great thing. So, you know, this is why we can undersize equipment compared to, you know, total nameplate rating of the loads. And you can see that here on the bottom left, you know, one EV, uh, charging, you need its full nameplate rating, but you have a thousand EV discharging and you need much fewer kilowatts per car because of the diversity. Now, once we start managing DERs, um, either through prices like time of use rates or some kind of program, we can get big step changes in load. And we now need to manage those step changes or increase our regulation reserves, which comes at a cost to handle them. And so as an example, this is from Green Mountain Power. It's their battery program that I'm sure, you know, most of you um, already know about how they use um, batteries, customer sided batteries to shave peak. And uh, they discharge these batteries to shave peak. But once they release the batteries, the batteries all want to charge. Um, and um, it creates a big step change. So they limit charging to 15% for an hour after releasing the batteries. You know, it's a kind of a crude way of, of managing that step change, but it is a way to manage this rebound effect. If you go to the next slide, um, this is Arizona Public Service. It's another method to manage um, these kinds of effects. So you're probably all aware Arizona Public Service has got two thirds of their customers on a time of use rate. And this is a crude tool that shapes their demand, right? Customers have adjusted their behavior or maybe they've set their electric vehicles to charge during off peak. Um, and those time of use rates um, uh, help to sort of pre-shape the demand. And then in real time, if there's a need, um, APS can deploy their DER programs um, which act as a, a precision tool 
And uh, there, they're you know aggregating their thermostats, the water heaters, pool pumps, et cetera. And this is just showing deployment of, of the thermostats during August 2020. Now they note they have to be careful about how they um, use the DER programs with the pricing. Um, you know, they're orchestrating their load shape in this way, but they don't want to dispatch the DERs to increase customer bills by increasing consumption during peak periods. So you can imagine there could be times when, you know, peak time of use periods don't line up with real time conditions. So they need to think very carefully about how these things interact. And I think this is going to become even more complex when we have, you know, third party providers um, involved in this as well. If you go to the next slide, um, folks had mentioned earlier prices to devices. Um, again, you know, I think at moderate levels, prices to devices are great. I think you get to really high DER levels and you need to think carefully about how the devices may act if they are responding to similar price thresholds. So, you know, if you wanna know what the system needs, um, it's not just price that gives you that answer. It is price and quantity, right? So a price could be high, but if the quantity is small, if it's a shallow price, um, then having a large quantity of megawatts chasing that price could, could backfire on you. And uh, this is just a graphic from ERCOT. Um, they have some loads that respond in an open-ended fashion to real-time prices, kind of like a prices to devices kind of idea. And um, they have a concern that this could increase the need for regulation reserves and also that if they had a lot of prices responding to similar price thresholds, that you could get oscillations in prices. Uh, if you go to the next slide, one way you can solve this is to dispatch a quantity to a price threshold that's expressed by the DERs. And this is just showing an example of controllable load resource programs um, where they treat load resources just like generators, right? They can bid into the day ahead market, the real time market, participate in ancillary services. They can set market prices. Um, and this is just a way to think about um, adding that this provides a, essentially like a reliability tool to the operator because it helps them balance both sides of the, the supply and demand at the same time. Um, you go to the next slide. Another aspect of operational needs is behavior during disturbances, and uh, Jenny already talked about this, um, and uh, I just wanted to um, point out, you know, LBNL is looking into EV charging that can provide grid-friendly or grid-unfriendly behavior during faults, similar to what Jenny was just talking about with uh, solar um, during faults, and uh, there's more work, I think, that we need to do and thinking about how EV chargers uh, act uh, during disturbances. If you go to the next slide, um, DERs are like the Swiss Army knives of the grid. And, um, you know, it's a great thing. We've already talked about this. I wanted to go down into the distribution system a little bit, and I've got one last slide. I realize I'm running out of time. If you go to the next slide, um, in general, I think. Um, DR value is going to be in reducing needs for generation, transmission, and distribution infrastructure. Um, and customer resilience is likely to increase in importance as we have more climate events. Um, and I think coordinating services between the kind of transmission and distribution and the customer level is um, the, the critical piece of what we're trying to address here. And again, this is just looking at the Green Mountain Power Battery Program um, they customers use those batteries for resilience during outages. And Green Mountain Power has to be careful to, um, uh, when they dispatch the batteries um, to um, avoid, uh, uh, to reduce their capacity requirements to ISO New England and, and also to reduce their, their transmission allocation charges, um, they have to be careful to um, hold a good state of charge for their customers in those batteries prior to potential extreme weather events, because that's what the customers need. And uh, so they're, they're very careful to make sure that, you know, the batteries are charged and went before the customer needs that for resilience. 
And today, ISO New England is summer peaking. You know, those extreme weather events are likely to be in the winter time. So this works out pretty well. In the future, when ISO New England becomes winter peaking, this kind of coordination may become more difficult. And so trying to, to figure out how we're going to coordinate that between the transmission, the distribution, and the customer needs is going to be something we're going to need to, um, to work on in the future. And I think that is my last slide. So thank you so much. Yeah, I want to thank our invited guests here. I know we're over our allotted time, um, so I think we're going to have to move into our break and onto the next panel. But let's please, um, we've had an active discussion and questions in the chat. So please, people, uh, people, please post uh, more questions there or in Slido for our guests here, and we'll try and field them through the rest of the time. I know um, Jenny, and Brian, Jenny and Brian have been doing that already. So. Please everyone give a round of applause, a round of applause for our guests here. Uh, thank you for your participation and your insights here. With that, I think we're going to move to the break. There we go. Thank you, everybody. We'll take 10 minutes and we will be back at 3. Uh, I guess it's four four oh one uh for our Pacific Coast people.
All right, welcome back everyone. It's um, 401, so we are going to jump right into our next panel. Um, if I could invite um, Amin from the Public Advocates Office to um, come off mute and we can get started. Great, I am all ready to go. Great. Um, Maggie, if I could have you advance the slides. Great. All right. Uh, so yeah, my name is Emin Yunus. I'm with the Public Advocates Office at the California Public Utilities Commission. I'm a utilities engineer, and I'll be giving Cal Advocates perspective on the operations needed for a future grid. Next slide, please. OK, so before I get into the content of this slide, um, I'll just say as a little bit of background that we used what we think of as the grid architecture approach, which is to start with a vision and objective for the grid, work our way into the operations needed for the grid before uh, determining the roles that those operations would be assigned to in a future, uh, at a future time. We also were, were influenced by the work of the Energy Networks Association, which is the UK's distribution and transmission trade agency. They've done a lot of work on this. And so a lot of the operations needed that I'll get to uh, on slides, I think four and five are drawn from that research. And uh, the last note is that uh, it's clear at this point that the operations we have on these slides go a bit beyond uh, the intended scope of this uh, of this workshop. We have things related to planning as well. Uh, I'll probably kind of reduce the focus on those a little bit, but I'll still touch on them because I think they're still relevant and interesting. With those uh, disclaimers out of the way, uh, I'm gonna start with what our vision for the future grid is. So, so we think there are gonna be two really important things happening on the grid over the next decade or two. The first is significant deployment of DERs. And importantly, many of these DERs, such as vehicle chargers, space and water, heat pumps, uh, and home battery storage have the capacity to respond to remote signals. Those remote signals could be price signals or they could be operational signals. So they could be uh, some sort of operator telling, set, turning the device on or off. Um, at the same time, California's bulk power system is going to be contending with very high generation of variable energy resources. Uh, we're talking here, of course, about wind and utility scale solar. And as the penetration of those types of resources increases, you have as this graph that I uh, is inspired by a, a plot created by NREL, I believe, um, shows we have this very nonlinear increase in the cost and difficulty of integrating this. You have lots more uh, short duration and then long duration storage required as the amount of, of penetration goes up. Um, so if you'll move to the next slide, please. Um, so we get to something very similar to what Brian Hannigan was just talking about on his slide from uh, Rocky Mountain Institute with flexible demand. But there's this huge opportunity to shift demand from periods of abundant uh, of, of low supply to periods of abundant supply. And of course, there's a little bit of a balance there, managing transmission and distribution constraints as well. But but unlocking flexible uh, flexible demand is, in our view, going to be at the core of the high DER future. That said, the, the whole goal and objective we're looking at is a little bit broader. Uh, flexible demand is a part of that and perhaps the most important part, but it's not the only part. So the goal that we articulate for the high DER future grid is that future grid operations and planning should provide the right signals to DERs so, so that they operate and locate when and where they maximize societal net benefit. I suppose for the purposes of this workshop, we're focusing more on operate versus planning and more on uh, oper where they, uh, sorry, when they operate rather than where they operate. Uh, and that societal net benefit is, is split up into these five objectives. First, we have minimizing cost, maximizing safety, maximizing reliability, minimizing environmental impact, and maximizing equity. And I see I'm, I'm about halfway through my time here, so I'll try to speed up a little bit and we can go to the next slide. So with this, we're gonna actually jump into the nuts and bolts of what we have today. These are the objectives that we have identified. Um, these are intended to be exhaustive. Um, I suspect that we probably didn't come up with every possible operation needed, but, but we certainly did our best. Um, and the first, the first operation, number one here, is the most nuts and bolts of all. That is operating the distribution grid. It's maintaining operational flexibility that we heard Devin Rouse talking about, maintaining voltage stability, maintaining safety requirements, you know, shutting power off to a line that, that touches the ground. These are kinds of very uh, important um, but nuts and bolts things. At the same time, the bulk power system has to maintain grid frequency. Now, that's really uh, 
CAISO or WEX responsibility, not so much the distribution operator, but the distribution operator can assist with this by providing inertia, whether it's real or synthetic inertia, providing generation capacity and providing frequency response. Uh, some entity or entities need to plan and procure the distribution grid. In the interest of time, and because this is, I think, out of scope a little bit, I'll, I'll skip over the details on that one, but it does have to be done. Um, more pertinent to this conversation, I think, is going to be uh, interconnection, which is bullet number four. Uh, this one I show in bold as a little bit of a preview that this is where we think there is a key gap. I understand that's for the future workshop, so I'm not going to talk more about it, but those are the bolded ones are the ones we think are, are particularly important. Interconnection involves setting policies, authorizing interconnection, actually implementing the interconnection, so, so uh, connecting it to the grid, and then most importantly, establishing the operating limits on DERs. So this is similar to what the uh, I think Jose was talking about with limited generation profiles, that great work that's being done in the interconnection proceeding, but there's a symmetrical work that could be done on the energization side for loads. And then, of course, we have smart inverter requirements um, that we were just hearing about as well, setting the voltage ride through requirements so that smart inverters aren't tripping offline, uh, volt var responsiveness, things like that. Okay, five and six are also, I think, some very important operations. They're choosing when to operate DERs and then actually operating those DERs. And there are many ways that could be done. I could uh, get home and plug in my electric vehicle. And that would be one way for me to choose when to operate that DER and then to operate the DER. Another option would be um, to have price responsiveness built into that EV charger and have the EV charger itself determine when to charge. And, you know, A third option would be for me to sign up with an aggregator who determines when my EV is charged. And yet a fourth option would be for a utilities derm system to decide when my EV is going to charge. These are all possible options to explore. But at the end of the day, some entity needs to choose how my car is going to charge actually I don't have an electric vehicle, but if I had an electric vehicle, someone would need to choose when it's gonna charge and someone would actually need to execute the command to charge it. Uh, the next one we've had a little bit of, of talk in the chat on, but this is basically the information that Kaiso needs. They need some information from the distribution grid operator. They need to understand load and what types of DERs and what the DERs are doing. I conceive of this as being relatively aggregated uh, in the example below, but it doesn't really matter to me whether uh, the Kaiso knows a lot about what's happening or a little bit. Um, that's the DER, or sorry, the distribution grid operator needs to convey that information to the Kaiso. Next slide, please. And I think I'm really short on time here. So most of these are, are fortunately for me, a little bit out of scope. Managing data access is really important, but I think that it's it's not exactly an operation. So we can skip over that one a little bit. Owning and funding the distribution grid and owning and funding and DERs. Again, these are important. Uh, these do have to happen in order to have a grid to have a grid to operate, but I think we can agree that that perhaps these are out of the scope of what what Jay was talking about earlier. Um, in scope is setting appropriate rates for consumption and generation based upon cost causation, and that is because um, uh, those rates will affect when and how DERs operate, and that then inherently affects the operation of the grid. I'll skip over a little bit more um, down to system defense and restoration. We have cybersecurity, emergency load reduction, resiliency, and black start. These are core functions of the grid. A very interesting one here is emergency load reduction. We already talked about load shedding previously, and there's a potential to have a little bit more intelligence in the load shedding. So instead of an entire block or a distribution area being shut down, um, perhaps EV chargers could be curtailed at a certain time, or uh, hot water heaters might be curtailed uh, remotely in a much more equitable way that's sharing that uh, load reduction rather than just certain neighborhoods going dark. Measuring metered data, again, needs to happen. And customers need to make informed consumption choices. So that information needs to be shared with customers uh, in order for them to make uh, informed choices about where to invest, what to invest in, and how to operate their DERs. They need to know those costs. Otherwise, they can't behave in a way that's optimal for them or optimal for society. All right, I'm a little bit over time, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Great. Thanks so much, Amin. Appreciate you. Um, next up, we have Samuel Golding representing the Utility Consumers Action Network. Um, Samuel, over to you. Uh, thanks, Neha. Uh, I'm Samuel Golding, president of Community Choice Partners and consultant on behalf of uh, UCAN. And I apologize in advance for presenting 20 slides in eight minutes. So next slide. 
Okay, our recommendations today are based on the insight that best achieving the Commission's seven objectives here is really going to come down to how quickly we can scale up relying on non-utility third-party investments in DERs, along with controls and services to orchestrate those DERs in ways that maximize use of the existing grid in order to displace and lower utility capital investments into the transmission and distribution networks. And credit where credit's due, that's less our unique insight and more the consensus view we see emerging across a lot of organized electricity markets grappling with these questions. Um, the new operating framework this requires has several features that we're categorizing today as either market enabling systems, uh, the new operating. My, what was that? Um, you're fine, Samuel. Go ahead. Okay. The new operating system that tracks and orchestrates and compensates uh, DERs, and also key market reforms, the new rules and business processes that enable load serving entities and aggregators to provide innovative services to customers. Next slide. And one more. Okay. Um, I'll hold off on explaining the six market reforms for time constraints. On the left, we're recommending these new platforms orchestrate DER services. Uh, should be deployed on a statewide basis to function optimally, uh, covering investor and utility territories and also including municipals that elect to participate. Each platform represents a function that's going to be necessary to create a rational operating framework and well-regulated DER marketplace. The Data Hub standard, standardizes data exchange and communications. The DER registered um, tracks uh, what assets are deployed across the state and the DER market platform actually facilitates the scheduling and trading of DER services and coordinating with KISO. Uh, while we're presenting these as discrete platforms, in part because our slides highlight real-world examples, they actually need to be tightly integrated and could conceivably be deployed in California as part of a single uh, statewide platform. Next slide. And one more. Okay, as context for the data hub, the current state of data exchange between the utilities and third parties is very inefficient, it's very fragmented. And when you consider how enabling innovative third party services will require expanding access across multiple utility subsystems, and also how data from third parties will need to start flowing back to inform market operations and utilities, it becomes apparent that we simply need a better approach to enabling data exchange that is standardized, uh, efficient, and extensible. Next slide. This has given rise to this data hub concept where stakeholders establish a comprehensive model and format for all the required data, along with a single API that allows any entity to request and receive the data they're authorized to use. Uh, the data flows to and from utilities through a neutral platform operator, managing third-party registrations and permissions, instead of relying on each utility to do so for their respective territories. Um, after deployment, the scope of data and the API evolves over time with stakeholder input to enable innovations and meet the needs of the DER marketplace. Next slide. New Hampshire has been developing a data hub implementation plan for a couple of years. It's recently become a proposal to DOE for a regional deployment across New England. And um, I'll disseminate an updated deck with links to that concept paper. Next slide. The second statewide platform or function, the DER register, um, the database uh, tracking the grid location and capabilities of the DER assets um, and keeps that updated. It's going to be increasingly critical uh, both for market operations and to enable accurate forecasting and planning. Next slide. The most well-known example went live in March 2020 in Australia, tracks behind the meter uh, DERs and all the database documentation, technical specifications are online. Next slide. Okay, third and finally, the DER market platform actually uh, schedules and trades demand flexibility and DER services across the distribution grid. It would allow utilities and load serving entities to contract for flexibility services across different time periods, integrates with the DER register, keeps utilities and load serving entities updated regarding DER availability, up through the moment that the DER is dispatched, and then it handles settlements after the trading day. Uh, over time, it would be expected to naturally evolve to coordinate with KISO, 
uh, markets and transmission operations. Next slide. So a number of these platforms that have been commercially deployed already and are scaling across the EU and Australia. PeakLowFlex is an industry leader with over 60,000 DR assets and 19 gigawatts of flexible capacity in the EU alone. Uh, they're now beginning to deepen coordination with wholesale grids and transmission networks. This screenshot actually shows the flexible capacity solicitations that are live right now in New York, where National Grid has deployed the platform. Next slide. Okay, that great. Yes. Um, so that brings us to our market reforms. To enable more granular balancing of supply and demand on a market-wide basis, smart meters and KISO demand bidding and load settlements should shift to 15-minute intervals instead of hourly intervals. A further enhancement would be to permit five-minute intervals for subsets of DER and demand flex customers. Two points of comparison are that 15-minute intervals are used in Texas, and five-minute intervals are now allowed in ISO New England. Next slide. Uh, in addition, going beyond the implementation of LMS compliant rates in 2027, we're recommending transmission costs be allocated to load serving entities for collection from retail customers. California utilities already allocate transmission costs uh, to customer classes on a monthly coincident peak demand basis, and that those costs could be allocated to LSEs on that same basis. This is already done in at least one FERC regulated market in Pennsylvania, PJM territory, and doing so would provide CCAs and ESPs with a very significant additional price signal and an incentive to flex demand and DERs in ways that lower uh, forecasted peak loads. Submetering protocols should also be expanded from EV supply equipment to also include inverter based resources and smart devices. And uh, that would allow more controllable loads and DERs to be exposed to dynamic rates, while non-controllable loads remain on the customer's otherwise applicable rate. We view this as a key consumer protection. It would really help avoid exposing customers to whole home bill shocks from any sort of high price events. Next slide. Those reforms would allow CCAs, for example, to deploy programs like the New Hampshire Electric Cooperative. Wow, what's going on with my slide there? That's odd. Well, I'll send around a fixed one. Um, okay, so in New Hampshire, the, the Electric Co-op forecasts the likely transmission peaks in multiple hours each month, passes the price signal through to submetered EVs, batteries, and water heaters, and customers are saving a lot of money each month by responding to those price signals, bypassing the transmission costs by shifting load off peak or selling power back on peak to lower overall network uh, demand. Next slide. Authorizing supplier uh, one back. Thank you. Authorizing supplier consolidated billing would allow CCAs and ESPs to assume responsibility for presenting a single bill to customers. Uh, that includes the utilities charges, uh, instead of relying on utilities to perform this function. And that would allow CCAs and ESPs to offer more innovative services and products to customers without being limited by what the utility billing systems can or can't support. So if you consider this in conjunction with our other recommended reforms, shifting to 15 five-minute settlements, shifting transmission costs to LSEs for collection, uh, expanding submetering and creating a DER market where uh, LSEs can monetize demand flexibility, this would position CCAs and ESPs to create a lot of new value for DER customers and in ways that make it easy for customers to participate and benefit. Next slide. Uh, as one example of what that could look like, uh, this is Octopus Energy, a retailer, an ESP in Texas. Uh, here, uh, they've just rolled out a program where customers can lease an electric vehicle, uh, authorize Octopus to handle all the behind the scenes managed charging services to lower costs. And the customer's experience is quite simplified. They just received unlimited free charging for signing up for this service. Next slide. Our last recommendation uh, is for community scale distribution interconnected uh, distributed energy resources. So it's 
like five megawatts and under, to be allowed to be counted as uh, load redu reducers for CCAs and ESPs, um, including for lowering peak demand for transmission cost charges. Uh, these assets would operate under the CP CPUC's jurisdiction on the DER market platform, uh, instead of registering as a supply resource bidding into the KISO market. And so this would create a market in which CCAs and ESPs would be financially incentivized to contract for potentially significant amounts of new distribution interconnected DERs, which would then be intelligently dispatched at all the right times to maximize cost savings for customers and the grid as a whole. Uh, next slide. And one more. Here's the Cliff Notes summary. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Samuel. Um, and I know that was a lot of information to run through. Um, so as a reminder, all the slides are posted um, on the GridWorks Future Study webpage for your review. Um, with that, we'll move on to our next presenter. We have Sam White um, representing 350 Bay Area. Take it away, Sam. Thank you, Nia. If you move to the next slide. 350 Bay Area is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So we are coming from a, both an environmental and a ratepayer perspective, meaning that we focus on the advancing state goals, including equity, affordability, emissions, and land use. We agree with a lot of what's been presented today, and we didn't want to repeat that. We want to offer more context. So next slide. So my focus today will be on the role of the electric grid in meeting our demand for energy because functional roles determine operational needs. Next slide, please. And operation starts at load, working from the bottom up. To address the operational needs of the distribution system, it's important to first understand the core function of our electric grid, which is to distribute power to help or assist in meeting demand for energy equitably and cost-effectively. Increasingly, as we've you know, all seen and agreed, the system is no longer a one-way flow from substations to load, but a multi-directional, scalable interaction between energy resources and intermingled loads. At any location, we may find loads, generation, storage, communication control equipment, potentially capable of meeting on-site loads and even serving nearby loads, a miniature version of the grid itself. Next slide, please. And we see that illustrated here in ways we're all familiar with. Next slide, please. Operation starts at load. The distribution system connects all of this in a layered architecture, which is replicated at every junction, approaching a fractal design from homes, within homes, to the ISO. This is important because it means that each layer or node only needs to interact electrically with the rest at either end of its points of connection. Everything beyond those points can be treated as a single aggregation. You need to know what it's doing, but you only need to know its net impact at the point of connection or interaction. Next slide, please. So layered architecture <clears throat> focuses on the interfaces between layers. The operator of each layer doesn't need visibility or control into the assets within the layer below, only the activity at its interface. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This has the potential to greatly simplify op operation and optimization because it allows operational data to reflect a single value at each junction. There's no need for a system to process all the details in real time of each component or each resource across multiple layers. Resources can be managed locally to reflect local constraints and available capacity, and within that capacity, serving the needs above or below. Next slide, please. This matters because demand is met through resources, and this starts with DER, because all demand begins where the load exists. DER includes loads and mitigations. It is the first layer in meeting demand and in mitigating the impacts of loads. And DER, both behind the meter and in front of the meter, includes energy efficiency, as well as demand response, distributed generation, energy storage, electric vehicles, and aggregations of these within buildings or microgrids of all sizes. Ultimately, less net load means less demand, which means less grid capacity costs at each layer. Next slide, please. So moving to the questions that were uh, posed for this individually. Next slide. 
efficient operation requires semi-optimal utilization of all available distributed energy resources. I say semi-optimal because perfection is not required. Utilization requires ha having enabling systems in place, that is, any available means for DER to receive or respond to information with reasonable timeliness and sufficient certainty. Information isn't the same as control. Information could be a signal or data, including tariff-based or live pricing or A and by data. Information can be stored or measured at the DER location and or communicated through any available medium. DER may react to data autonomously or respond to coordinated control signals. Coordination of individual DER should include layered aggregation of this data. Each aggregation is seen as a single entity in the next layer with a single net impact that needs to be responded to. This greatly simplifies operation and offers security over single point failure. Efficient operation means least net cost. Next slide, please. Briefly touching on economic opportunities, within the Smart Inverter Operationalization Working Group in the report that just uh, was recently released and included in the packet, we focused on utilize, utilization of existing inverter functionalities, identified numerous high priority use cases and business cases based on technology readiness, cost, scale, and timeline. Beyond that, we also need to focus on standard tariffs and contracts which are needed, designed to support the stacked value of uses of resources. Traditional contracts and tariffs have often inhibited enrolling and utilizing DER for multiple purposes. A stacked value recognizes that any available capacity across all resources in an aggregate, instead of reserving each resource for a single role and leaving otherwise capacity underutilized. And we see the DSO in whatever form that takes as a nexus to simplify signaling in layered coordination and to simplify potentially as a single point of revenue of access to revenue streams. Next slide, please. Focusing on at least net cost over time <clears throat> reduces rate pair costs. Utilizing the full set of cost effectiveness tests, including societal cost tests plus the voting cost calculator, and recognizing that each test has inherent limits, which must be recognized, including a pervasive failure to count future avoided costs. We also want to emphasize that inequitable energy burdens start with costs. Reducing costs reduce inequity. We've seen the, in the, the first uh, estimate of the um, electrification impact study, a potential $50 billion cost for unmitigated electrification. And public advocates analysis shows that even the simplest mitigation cuts this in half. We've seen up to $120 billion in avoidable costs uh, <clears throat> through optimization of DEA oper uh, operation in the next 30 years uh, in additional detailed study and separately, an additional $60 billion in potentially avoidable transmission costs in that same time period by 2050, because every megawatt hour needs to come from somewhere, and local resources reduce the need for additional upstream capacity. Savings require easy DER engagement and pricing of energy and services. Next slide, please. Obviously, grid resiliency, you can do a lot with local resources there, potentially even to the point of islanding at times. And we have enormous capacity uh, that we've talked about coming today of already 15 gigawatts of, of uh, rooftop solar, more than that potential in the future, an equally large or larger amount of fronted demand of the meter distributed generation, which is barely tapped yet today, flexible lo building loads. You know, 80 gigawatts of, of EV battery storage deployed by 2030, which should give us about eight gigawatts of flexible demand within that at any given time, bidirectionality. That brings us to the last, which is meeting state policy objectives. Next slide, please. Bottom line is it requires all of the above. The objectives are large, they're wide ranging, they're focused on meeting the needs at each location. And the grid is what allows resources to be shared between locations, both locally and system-wide. We can only utilize <clears throat> these resources to help meet the needs to the degree that they're available, and DER are a huge resource. But that's our time, and thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions for our panelists, you can um, put those in the chat.
Um, and next up, we have Lorenzo Kristoff from the Climate Center. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's really good to be here, and um, I appreciate uh, being the invitation to participate. I'm representing the Climate Center, which is a, a nonprofit focused on Climate Safe California, their major program, and community energy resilience. Uh, next slide, please. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, here I've just bulletized the seven objectives that were in the question for today's workshop. And because in the second half of this presentation, I have a slide devoted to each one of these. Uh, next slide, please. The punchline really of my presentation is that the, the needed structural element to address all of those seven objectives is to create an open access distribution network and a transactive distribution level market or markets that enables all DERs on both sides of the end use customer meter to economically transact energy and grid services. I'll explain what that means and what the specific operational needs are, but just to uh, explain, to motivate it a little bit, what I'm talking about is very much like what the ISO does on the transmission grid. It allocates use of the transmission system, it manages real-time operation, and it also conducts an energy market in which all of the parties can transact. And I'm thinking here and suggesting creating the counterpart to that or the analogy for that at distribution level. The idea of a transactive distribution level market provides lots of benefits in the sense of opportunities for customers who invest in DERs, as well as other third parties to recoup some of the value of their DERs through providing services, and at the same time, enables the system and society at large to get more benefits from those. It incentivizes private investment because of the ability to transact and earn revenues. And specifically, I want to point out that I'm talking about all distributed resources on both sides of the end use customer meter. A lot of today's discussion has talked about DERs as being customer owned behind the meter, providing demand modification. And what I think has been largely missing from our discussions about the future grid is front of meter resources that become significant suppliers of renewable energy. We don't view the distribution system as enough as a potential source of grid supply. So this transactive distribution level market will also encourage that type of investment. Once we accept this notion of creating this type of open access network and transactive markets, then the operational needs of the DSO derive from that, which include both the operations at distribution level as well as coordination with the ISO as uh, has also been emphasized today. Next slide, please. So here I'll get into a little bit more of the specific um, operational needs that uh, that are implied by that uh, assumption of an open access trans act transactive network. And these needs are really identified in a way by analogy to what the ISO does on the uh, bulk system, um, but it's also about coordination. So first of all, defining grid services that DERs can economically provide. What would those be? What are the services that the distribution grid operator needs as well as potentially trading uh, energy? And as an example, compensating DERs and aggregators for flattening circuit level peaks, both load and supply, what I call the ducklings at circuit level, to increase hosting capacity without upgrading circuits. We heard today in earlier presentations, I'm thinking specifically of the ones from Quinn and Audrey about electric vehicle charging and how that can be disruptive if it's not coordinated. Well, there's a service that can be defined that an aggregator could provide that flattens net load, net load profiles at circuit levels or across transformer banks, and that reduces the need for upgrade and accommodates greater amount of investment. It's these kinds of things that can be formally turned into services that are procured and compensated. Once you define the services then, the DSO needs to conduct non-discriminatory procedures for procuring, dispatching, and compensating the DERs. And the first sub-bullet under that is market mechanisms. What would that look like? So something like a day ahead market in which 
the participating resources offer bids and the DSO accepts those bids and clears them linked to an accurate up-to-date model of the distribution network and current distribution system conditions. It clears those results, sends the results to participants. It will need real-time communication with the participating DERs because as we know, distribution grid conditions can change fairly quickly. It needs to conduct solicitations for longer term services and then accurately measure DER grid service uh, performance and perform settlements. Once we have these services defined and can start and they start to become predictable and they elicit the kind of investment we want to see in these services, then these services can be pump, become part of distribution network planning. Network planning often looks at worst cases. In other words, what happens with um, DER performance if it's uncoordinated and just responding to what customers want to use them for. If they're coordinated, then that really has a value as we plan the needs for distribution network upgrades. Next slide, please. So uh, continuing operational needs, one of the things that will be required is to help the entities that want to do local investment in DERs, local governments, tribes, load serving entities, DER developers, community based organizations, et cetera. They need up to date network information so that they can plan and deploy DERs, not just to meet the needs of the customers or the communities where they're developing these resources, but also to optimally utilize existing grid capacity and to be of maximum benefit in providing grid services. The final major piece here is coordinating with CAISO operations and markets. I'm thinking both day ahead and real time at the TD interfaces. So if the DSO operates a market at distribution level and it clears that market in advance of bid submission into the CAISO day ahead market, that enables the DSO then to provide an accurate forecast to the CAISO of what's the expected net interchange across the TD interface. Similarly, in real time, the DSO could conduct a similar solicitation market clearing that's coordinated with the ISO market. Then as the ISO clears its markets, some of those results come back to the DSO to disseminate to the participating DERs. The um, Another point that was raised uh, earlier is about customer meter data and current distribution systems provided by the DSO to load serving entities to support their CAISO bidding and schedule. One of the, uh, one of the root causes back in the uh, outage in August 2020, when the, the root cause analysis was done, was LSEs having difficulty forecasting their actual loads, um, much of it due to unavailability on a timely manner of, CAI, of uh, uh, end use customer meter data, and then supporting direct participation in the CAISO markets through timely provision of system conditions and curtailment procedures. Next slide, please. Maximizing the benefits. So as I look at the future and think about DERs, DER cost and performance keep improving. They're getting more attractive while grid costs keep rising, which I think we need to pay attention to the potential for grid defection, which becomes increasingly cost effective given those trends. Unfortunately, it's going to be the customers that have financial resources, large businesses, affluent homeowners who are going to be able to do this, who will be incentivized to do this. But if we see significant grid defection by these customers, all of the inequities are worsened. So the open access transition Transactive network is the better alternative. It rewards customers for staying connected and participating in the transactive markets. And it also makes DERs more accessible to more customers because it provides revenue opportunities that defray the investment costs. Next slide, please. Please. Okay, um, almost done here. Uh, I won't be able to go all of these through, but um, there's a slide here for each of the seven goals. and. Um, what I want to mention on this one is stimulating private investment once we start seeing community resources that are able to provide local energy to meet local loads, locating energy close to load to deal with growing electrification demand. Um, the ability to transact is going to be crucial to that kind of investment. Next slide, please. Um, reducing ratepayer costs. Um, 
it makes it commercially viable to deploy local supply to meet local demand, reducing the need for bulk system generation and transmission, as well as using aggregators and LSEs to coordinate DERs, flatten circuit and transmission load profiles, reducing deinvestment needs. The longer term play here is that DERs reduce infrastructure investment needs and enables then ratepayers who deploy DERs of their assets. Next slide, please. Uh, increasing equity. Here is an aspect that's not talked about enough, but uh, these transactive markets, opportunities to recover investment costs means that more customers and communities will be able to own assets locally. Local ownership of assets is key to uh, to uh, increasing equity and energy justice. Other things are good too, like rate uh, support for uh, low income rates and so on, but it's really through owning assets that communities build wealth and DERs enable communities to own assets that supply energy that can earn revenues once we set up the, uh, the, the appropriate types of market mechanisms to enable them to do that. Um, and I think I think I'll end here because uh, I don't want to. I'm running out of time, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lorenzo. Um, and yeah, Lorenzo has a handful of other slides here um, that are posted on the GridWorks um, Future Grid Study website. Um, so please check those out when you are able. Um, all right, our final presenter of um, the workshop today is Nikhil Vajaker, um, representing the Joint CCAs. Um, Nikhil, welcome. Thanks, Neha. Uh, Nikhil Vajaker, I'm a partner with Keys and Fox, and I am counsel to the joint CCAs, and I have the distinct honor of being the last speaker today. So I'll I'll try to be quick. Uh, I think we've heard some overlap in the visions and objectives and, and even some of the concrete recommendations that today's speakers have offered, even if each of those speakers play a slightly different role with respect to a high DER grid. Um, the community choice aggregators, uh, whom I represent, have a unique role in that system, and that role is evolving. But I, I think it's fair to say that the, the their, their vision and objectives overlap with what we've heard today, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my presentation. So what I want to do is briefly provide the CCA's perspective on the scoping issue. I'll try to stay away from issues that other presenters have covered. Um, I think in my, in our view, a key sub question that's, that's kind of wrapped up in the scoping issue is what do we as stakeholders need in order to ensure that a high DER grid involves DERs acting in, in grid beneficial ways that benefit all customers, right? Rather than increasing system costs. So if you remember nothing else from this end of the day presentation, uh, I hope you're able to remember the following two things from this presentation. What, the first is that CCAs today already run a wide variety of DER programs, and the number and the diversity of those programs uh, continues to grow. And the second is that better data, so that means distribution system data, customer load and uses data, and program participation data, all of that can help CCAs drive more value. And Neha, we can we can stay on the first slide. I'm, I'm still still there. Um, better data can help CCAs drive more value for all customers that's bundled and unbundled customers from their programs. In other words, respond to some of the operational needs that we've been discussing today. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. So really quickly, I think many of you here know what CCAs are all about. They're local government agencies and they're load-serving entities. Um, CCAs today serve over 14 million customers across more than 200 cities and counties across California. Um, the, the basic basics are that CCAs receive generation services, customers receive generation services from their local CCA, and then they receive transmission, delivery, billing, and other services from the IOU. And CCAs want to provide value to the system, right? Benefit all customers, bundled and unbundled, and through their programs, their customers are in a position to do so. Next slide, please. So one of the CCA's key interests in, in this proceeding is to enable stronger CCA-run DER programs. And, and as I mentioned, today, CCAs already run many different flavors of DER programs, including solar, storage, EV, DR programs, and generally, these are self-funded programs 
run through generation revenues. And CCAs run these programs because they're responsive to their customers' needs and their community's needs, and because they accelerate decarbonization. And as a general matter, whether those programs involve solar or storage or EVs or demand response, today they're oriented towards wholesale market conditions. So they're oriented towards encouraging load reductions during peak hours when the grid as a whole is under maximum stress. Next slide, please. So I won't go through this in detail. It's a more in-depth sum summary of existing programs run by the joint CCAs. It's not exhaustive. A lot of other CCAs out there running innovative DER programs. Just a couple common threads. One, these programs are incremental to what IOUs and other aggregators offer. They're generally structured as incentives for grid beneficial technologies and behaviors. They generally shift load away from peak hours and they aim to help customers achieve savings. Now, the CCAs are innovating in program design and delivery, but that innovation can be better harnessed through better integration with distribution planning and operations. Next slide, please. So this is basically my, my problem statement slide, right? Which is transparency and data access, in our view, is, is a critical foundation that will allow CCAs and other entities to develop and deploy programs at, at the lowest possible cost. So again, we're talking about program participation data, load and usage data, but also distribution system data. Today, CCAs don't even know where their customers exist on the distribution system, let alone the constraints on specific circuits or substations to which those customers are connected. So at, at the highest level, better information on grid needs would enable stronger TER programs. Again, currently programs are being optimized based on bulk needs, which is fine, but that could cause localized issues. I think it was Quinn from PG&E that pointed out that local and system needs can be uncorrelated or even negatively correlated. So you, you only meet and orchestrate the needs of the energy system as a whole, then you could be exacerbating constraints on the distribution grid. So fundamentally, without a locationally informed price, we are risking inefficient behaviors, we're risking inefficient grid utilization, such as you know, charging EVs on a circuit while a circuit's peaking. So where does that leave us? Next slide, please. Uh, fundamentally, better data and better signals, and that can be in many different forms, as I think Sam pointed out, uh, that would help both existing and new CCA programs. As far as the existing programs go, uh, better data would allow CCAs to optimize the dispatch of DERs around distribution needs, uh, it could help reduce operational challenges, such as voltage spikes or sags or congestion, uh, and then ultimately uh, defer upgrades and reduce distribution system cost. And looking ahead to new programs, uh, better data would enable CCAs to target customer engagement, target incentives, drive adoption of DERs in areas where there is an identified grid need. And, and I want to point out, in both of these cases, the solution doesn't necessarily require that there be active utility control or dispatch. <clears throat> so I'll again wrap up uh, just with some of the key things that I'm hoping uh, you all take away from this. Next slide, please. The first is that uh, you know CCAs are already running a variety of DER programs. Second is that under the status quo, CCAs lack enough information to optimize those DER programs around distribution system needs. And finally, uh, there's an opportunity here, right? CCA programs can provide better value to all customers and to the system with better information and signals that can incentivize solutions to those constraints. That's all I got. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Nikhil. And you finished ahead of time, which puts us right on time um, to close out for um, the day. Thank you all for staying with us um, for the last three hours and 50 minutes. Um, I will try to make our closing brief um, so we can all get off the screens. Um, as Matthew mentioned at the beginning of the workshop, um, if upon reflection, you go back and read, you have an amazing dream overnight about what the grid needs to incorporate high DERs, um, please email any of those additional comments um, to Maggie. Um, her email address is here on the screen um, and it will also be available um, on the website. And please email those comments by February 22nd. 
Um, Gridworks will pull together a summary of today's workshops, um, including any additional comments received. Um, and we will distribute that by March 2nd. Um, we'll also post that on our California Grid Study website. Um, and this is just the beginning. As Jay mentioned at the outset, um, this is workshop one of three. Um, so our second workshop will be on March 12th. Um, same time, same place, 1 to 5 p.m. Um, on Zoom, um, where we will consider, you know, now that today we've come up with our wish list of all the operational needs of um, the future grid, grid, what are the gaps between where we are today and what we need to do to get there? Um, and finally, um, our last Slido ask of the day, um, we'd love your feedback on how the workshop went today and um, if there's anything we can do to ensure that workshop number two um, is helpful and even better. Um, I see a question in the comment, uh, sorry, a question in the chat um, asking if there's gonna be an opportunity to comment on the summary. Um, no, there will not be an opportunity to comment on the summary, but there will be an opportunity once the full future grid study comes out at the end of the three workshop series um, to provide comment on that study. And that will be part of the official um, CPUC record. Any other um, questions, comments, thoughts before we um, close things out for today? Now, I was just going to check with uh, staff from the commission or the commissioner or the judge uh, if any um, closing thoughts or encouragement wants to be shared. Just wanted to thank everyone. Great presentations. Going to go back and look through them some more and looking forward to the report on March 2nd. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, um, hearing none, we'll leave this up for a moment um, so you know um, what are all the upcoming dates and so you can get that Slido QR code and Slido link um, to fill out that feedback survey. Um, and thank you all for um, your time this afternoon. We really appreciate it and we hope to see you at workshop number two. Steve, but it it might move. I I